American Notes, Chapter Fourteen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Brad Philippone. American Notes by Charles Dickens, Chapter Fourteen. Return to Cincinnati. A stagecoach ride from that city to Columbus, and thence to Sandusky. So by Lake Erie to the Falls of Niagara. As I had a desire to travel through the interior of the state of Ohio, and to strike the lakes, as the phrase is, at a small town called Sandusky, to which that route would conduct us on our way to Niagara, we had to return from St. Louis by the way we had come, and to retrace our former track as far as Cincinnati. The day on which we were to take leave of St. Louis being very fine, and the steamboat which was to have started I don't know how early in the morning postponing, for the third or fourth time, her departure until the afternoon, we rode forward to an old French village on the river, properly called Carondelet, and nicknamed Vide Poach, and arranged that the packet should call for us there. The place consisted of a few poor cottages, and two or three public houses, the state of whose larder certainly seemed to justify the second designation of the village, for there was nothing to eat in any of them. At length, however, by going back some half a mile or so, we found a solitary house where ham and coffee were procurable, and there we tarried to wait the advent of the boat, which would come in sight from the green before the door a long way off. It was a neat, unpretending village tavern, and we took our repast in a quaint little room with a bed in it, decorated with some old oil paintings, which in their time had probably been done in a Catholic chapel or monastery. The fare was very good, and served with great cleanliness. The house was kept by a characteristic old couple, with whom we had a long top, and who were perhaps a very good sample of that kind of people in the West. The landlord was a dry, tough, hard-faced old fellow, not so very old either, for he was but just turned sixty, I should think, who had been out with the militia in the last war with England, and had seen all kinds of service, except a battle, and he had been very near seeing that, he added, very near. He had all his life been restless and locomotive, with an irresistible desire for change, and there was still the son of his old self, for if he had nothing to keep him at home, he said, slightly jerking his hat and his thumb towards the window of the room in which the old lady sat, as we stood talking in front of the house, he would clean up his musket and be off to Texas to-morrow morning. He was one of the very many descendants of Cain proper to this continent, who seemed destined from their birth to serve as pioneers in the great human army, who gladly go on from year to year extending its outposts, and leaving home after home behind them, and die at last utterly regardless of their graves being left thousands of miles behind by the wandering generation who succeed. His wife was a domesticated, kind-hearted old soul who had come with him from the queen city of the world, which it seemed was Philadelphia, but had no love for this western country, and indeed had little reason to bear it any, having seen her children one by one die here of fever in the full prime and beauty of their youth. Her heart was sore, she said, to think of them, and to talk on this theme even to strangers in that blighted place so far from her old home eased it somewhat, and became a melancholy pleasure. The boat appearing towards evening, we bade adieu to the poor old lady and her vagrant spouse, and making for the next landing-place were soon on board. The messenger again, in our old cabin, and steaming down the Mississippi. If the coming up this river, slowly making head against the stream, be an irksome journey, the shooting down it with the turbid current is almost worse for then the boat, proceeding at the rate of twelve or fifteen miles an hour, had to force its passage through a labyrinth of floating logs, which in the dark it is often impossible to see beforehand or avoid. All that night the bell was never silent for five minutes at a time, and after every ring the vessel reeled again, sometimes beneath a single blow, sometimes beneath a dozen dealt in quick succession, the lightest of which seemed more than enough to beat in her frail keel, as though it had been pie-crust. Looking down upon the filthy river after dark, it seemed to be alive with monsters as these black masses rolled upon the surface, or came starting up again head first, when the boat, in ploughing her way among a shoal of such obstructions, drove a few among them for the moment under water. Sometimes the engine stopped during a long interval, and then before her and behind, and gathering close about her on all sides, were so many of these ill-favoured obstacles that she was fairly hemmed in, the centre of a floating island, 
and was constrained to pause until they parted somewhere, as dark clouds will do before the wind, and opened by degrees a channel out. In good time next morning, however, we came again in sight of the detestable morass called Cairo, and stopping there to take in wood lay alongside a barge, whose starting timbers scarcely held together. It was moored to the bank, and on its side was painted coffee-house, that being, I suppose, the floating paradise to which the people fly for shelter when they lose their houses for a month or two beneath the hideous waters of the Mississippi. But looking southward from this point, we had the satisfaction of seeing that intolerable river dragging its slimy length and ugly freight abruptly off towards New Orleans, and passing a yellow line which stretched across the current, were again upon the clear Ohio, never, I trust, to see the Mississippi more, saving in troubled dreams and nightmares. Leaving it for the company of its sparkling neighbour was like the transition from pain to ease, or the awakening from a horrible vision to cheerful realities. We arrived at Louisville on the fourth night, and gladly availed ourselves of its excellent hotel. Next day we went on in the Ben Franklin, a beautiful mail steamboat, and reached Cincinnati shortly after midnight. Being by this time nearly tired of sleeping upon shelves, we had remained awake to go ashore straightway, and groping a passage across the dark decks of other boats, and among the labyrinths of engine machinery and leaking casks of molasses, we reached the streets, knocked up the porter at the hotel where we had stayed before, and were, to our great joy, safely housed soon afterwards. We rested but one day at Cincinnati, and then resumed our journey to Sandusky. As it comprised two varieties of stagecoach travelling, which, with those I have already glanced at, comprehend the main characteristics of this mode of transit in America, I will take the reader as our fellow-passenger, and pledge myself to perform the distance with all possible dispatch. Our place of destination in the first instance is Columbus. It is distant about a hundred and twenty miles from Cincinnati, but there is a macabondized road, rare blessing the whole way, and the rate of travelling upon it is six miles an hour. We start at eight o'clock in the morning, in a great mail-coach, whose huge cheeks are so very ruddy and plethoric, that it appears to be troubled with a tendency of blood to the head. Dropsical it certainly is, for it will hold a dozen passengers inside, but wonderful to add, it is very clean and bright, being nearly new, and rattles through the streets of Cincinnati gaily. Our way lies through a beautiful country, richly cultivated and luxuriant, in its promise of an abundant harvest. Sometimes we pass a field where the strong, bristling stalks of Indian corn look like a crop of walking-sticks, and sometimes an enclosure where the green wheat is springing up among a labyrinth of stumps. The primitive worm-fence is universal, and an ugly thing it is, but the farms are neatly kept, and save for these differences, one might be travelling just now in Kent. We often stop to water at a roadside inn, which is always dull and silent. The coachman dismounts and fills his bucket, and holds it to the horses' heads. There is scarcely ever any one to help him. There are seldom any loungers standing round, and never any stable company with jokes to crack. Sometimes, when we have changed our team, there is a difficulty in starting again, arising out of the prevalent mode of breaking a young horse, which is to catch him, harness him against his will, and put him in a stage-coach without further notice. But we get on somehow or other, after a great many kicks and a violent struggle, and jog on as before again. Occasionally, when we stop to change, some two or three half-dozen loafers will come loitering out with their hands in their pockets, or will be seen kicking their heels in rocking-chairs, or lounging on the window-sill, or sitting on a rail within the colonnade. They have not often anything to say, though, either to us or to each other, but sit there idly staring at the coach and horses. The landlord of the inn is usually among them, and seems, of all the party, to be the least connected with the business of the house. Indeed, he is with reference to the tavern, what the driver is in relation to the coach and passengers. Whatever happens in his sphere of action, he is quite indifferent, and perfectly easy in his mind. The frequent change of coachman works no change or variety in the coachman's character. He is always dirty, sullen, and taciturn. If he be capable of smartness of any kind, moral or physical, he has a faculty of concealing it which is truly marvellous. He never speaks to you as you sit behind him in the box, and if you speak to him he answers, if at all, in monosyllables. He points out nothing on the road, and seldom looks at anything, being to all appearance thoroughly weary of it and existence generally. As to doing the honours of his coach, his business, as I have said, is with the horses. 
The coach follows because it is attached to them, and goes on wheels, not because you are in it. Sometimes, towards the end of a long stage, he suddenly breaks out into a discordant fragment of an election song, but his face never sings along with him. It is only his voice, and not often that. He always chews, and always spits, and never encumbers himself with a pocket-handkerchief. The consequences to the box-passenger, especially when the wind blows towards him, are not agreeable. Whenever the coach stops, and you can hear the voices of the inside passengers, or whenever any bystander addresses them, or any one among them, or they address each other, you will hear one phrase repeated over and over and over again to the most extraordinary extent. It is an ordinary and unpromising phrase enough, being neither more nor less than, yes, sir, but it is adapted to every variety of circumstance, and fills up every pause in the conversation. Thus. The time is one o'clock at noon. The scene, a place where we are to stay and dine on this journey. The coach drives up to the door of an inn. The day is warm, and there are several idlers lingering about the tavern, and waiting for the public dinner. Among them is a stout gentleman in a brown hat, swinging himself to and fro in a rocking-chair on the pavement. As the coach stops, a gentleman in a straw hat looks out of the window. Straw hat, to the stout gentleman in the rocking-chair. I reckon that's Judge Jefferson, ain't it? Brown hat, still swinging, speaking very slowly and without any emotion whatever. Yes, sir. Straw hat. Warm weather, Judge. Brown hat. Yes, sir. Straw hat. There was a snap of cold last week. Brown hat. Yes, sir. Straw hat. Yes, sir. A pause. They look at each other very seriously. Straw hat. I calculate you'll have got through that case of the corporation, Judge, by this time now. Brown hat. Yes, sir. Straw hat. How did the verdict go, sir? Brown hat. For the defendant, sir. Straw hat. Interrogatively. Yes, sir. Brown hat. Affirmatively. Yes, sir. Both, musingly, as each gazes down the street. Yes, sir. Another pause. They look at each other again, still more seriously than before. Brown hat. This coach is rather behind its time today, I guess. Straw hat, doubtingly. Yes, sir. Brown hat, looking at his watch. Yes, sir, nigh upon two hours. Straw hat, raising his eyebrows in very great surprise. Yes, sir. Brown hat, decisively, as he puts up his watch. Yes, sir. All the other inside passengers, among themselves. Yes, sir. Coachman, in a very surly tone. No, it ain't. Straw hat to the coachman. Well, I don't know, sir. We were a pretty tall time coming that last fifteen mile, that's a fact. The coachman, making no reply, and plainly declining to enter into any controversy on a subject so far removed from his sympathies and feelings, another passenger says, Yes, sir and the gentleman in the straw hat, in acknowledgment of his courtesy, says yes, sir, to him in return. The straw hat then inquires of the brown hat whether that coach in which he, the straw hat, then sits is not a new one, to which the brown hat again makes answer, yes, sir. Straw hat, I thought so. Pretty loud smell of varnish, sir. Brown hat, yes, sir. All the other inside passengers, yes, sir. Brown hat, to the company in general, yes, sir. The conversational powers of the company, having been by this time pretty heavily taxed, the straw hat opens the door and gets out, and all the rest alight also. We dine soon afterwards with the boarders in the house, and have nothing to drink but tea and coffee. As they are both very bad and the water is worse, I ask for brandy, but it is a temperance hotel, and spirits are not to be had for love or money. This preposterous forcing of unpleasant drinks down the reluctant throats of travellers is not at all uncommon in America, but I never discovered that the scruples of such wincing landlords induced them to preserve any unusually nice balance between the quality of their face and their scale of charges. On the contrary, I rather suspected them of diminishing the one and exalting the other, by way of recompense for the loss of their profit on the sale of spirituous liquors. After all, perhaps the plainest course for persons of such tender consciousness would be a total abstinence from tavern-keeping. Dinner over, we get into another vehicle which is ready at the door, for the coach has been changed in the interval, and resume our journey which continues through the same kind of country until evening, when we come to the town where we are to stop for tea and supper, and having delivered the mail-bags at the post-office, ride through the usual wide street, lined with the usual stores and houses, 
the drapers having hung up at their door by way of sign a piece of bright red cloth to the hotel where this meal is prepared there being many boarders here we sit down a large party and a very melancholy one as usual but there is a buxom hostess at the head of the table and opposite a simple welsh schoolmaster and with his wife and child who came here on a speculation of greater province than performance to teach the classics and they are sufficient subjects of interest until the meal is over and another couch is ready in it we go on once more lighted by a bright moon until midnight when we stop to change the coach again and remain for half an hour or so in a miserable room with a blurred lithograph of washington over the smoky fireplace and a mighty jug of cold water on the table to which refreshment the moody passengers do so apply themselves that they would seem to be one and all keen patients of dr sandrago among them is a very little boy who chews tobacco like a very big one and a droning gentleman who talks arithmetically and statistically on all subjects from poetry downwards who always speaks in the same key with exactly the same emphasis and with very grave deliberation he came outside just now and told me how that the uncle of a certain young lady who had been spirited away and married by a certain captain lived in these parts and how this uncle was so valiant and ferocious that he shouldn't wonder if he were to follow the said captain to england and shoot him down in the street wherever he found him in the feasibility of which strong measure i being for the moment rather prone to contradiction from feeling half asleep and very tired declined to acquiesce assuring him that if the uncle did resort to it or gratified any other little whim of the like nature he would find himself one morning prematurely throttled at the old bailey and that he would do well to make his will before he went as he would certainly want it before he had been in britain very long on we go all night and by and by the day begins to break and presently the first cheerful rays of the warm sun come slanting on us brightly it sheds its light upon a miserable waste of sodden grass and dull trees and squalid huts whose aspect is forlorn and grievous in the last degree a very desert in the woods whose growth of green is dank and noxious like that upon the top of standing water where poisonous fungus grows in the rare footprint on the oozy ground and sprouts like witch's coral from the crevices of the cabin wall and floor it is a hideous thing to lie upon the very threshold of a city but it was purchased years ago and as the owner cannot be discovered the state has been unable to reclaim it so there it remains in the midst of cultivation and improvement like ground accursed and made obscene and rank by some great crime we reached columbus shortly before seven o'clock and stayed there to refresh that day and night having excellent apartments at a very large unfinished hotel called the neal house which were richly fitted with the polished wood of the black walnut and opened on a handsome portico and stone veranda like rooms in some italian mansion the town is clean and pretty and of course is going to be much larger it is the seat of the state legislature of ohio and lays claim in consequence to some consideration and importance there being no stage-coach next day upon the road we wish to take i hired an extra at a reasonable charge to take us to tiffin a small town from whence there is a railroad to sandusky this extra was an ordinary four-horse stage-coach such as i have described changing horses and drivers as the stage-coach would but was exclusively our own for the journey to ensure our having horses at the proper stations and being incommoded by no strangers the proprietors sent an agent on the box who was to accompany us the whole way through and thus attended and bearing with us besides a hamper full of savoury cold meats and fruit and wine we started off again in high spirits at half-past six o'clock next morning very much delighted to be by ourselves and disposed to enjoy even the roughest journey it was well for us that we were in this humour for the road we went over that day was certainly enough to have shaken tempers that were not resolutely at set fair down to some inches below stormy at one time we were all flung together in a heap at the bottom of the coach and at another we were crushing our heads against the roof now one side was down deep in the mire and we were holding on to the other now the coach was lying on the tails of the two wheelers and now it was rearing up in the air in a frantic state with all four horses standing on the top of an insurmountable eminence looking coolly back at it as though they would say unharness us it can't be done the drivers on these roads 
who certainly get over the ground in a manner which is quite miraculous, so twist and turn the team about in forcing a passage corkscrew fashion through the bogs and swamps, that it was quite a common circumstance on looking out of the window to see the coachman with the ends of the pair of reins in his hands, apparently driving nothing or playing at horses, and the leaders staring at one another unexpectedly from the back of the coach, as if they had some idea of getting up behind. A great portion of the way was over what is called a corduroy road, which is made by throwing trunks of trees into a marsh and leaving them to settle there. The very slightest of the jolts with which the ponderous carriage fell from log to log was enough, it seemed, to have dislocated all the bones in the human body. It would be impossible to experience a similar set of sensations in any other circumstances, unless perhaps in attempting to go up to the top of St. Paul's in an omnibus never never once that day was the coach in any position attitude or kind of motion to which we are accustomed in coaches never did it make the smallest approach to one's experience of the proceedings of any sort of vehicle that goes on wheels still it was a fine day and the temperature was delicious and though we had left summer behind us in the west we were fast leaving spring we were moving towards niagara and home we alighted in a pleasant wood towards the middle of the day, dined on a fallen tree, and leaving our best fragments with a cottager, and our worst with the pigs, who swarm in this part of the country like grains of sand on the seashore, to the great comfort of our commissariat in Canada. We went forward again, gaily. As night came on, the track grew narrower and narrower, until at last it so lost itself among the trees that the driver seemed to find his way by instinct. We had the comfort of knowing at least that there was no danger of his falling asleep, for every now and then a wheel would strike against an unseen stump with such a jerk that he was fain to hold on pretty tight and pretty quick to keep himself upon the box. Nor was there any reason to dread the least danger from furious driving, inasmuch as over that broken ground the horses had enough to do to walk. As to shying, there was no room for that, and a herd of wild elephants could not have run away in such a wood with such a coach at their heels. So we stumbled along quite satisfied. These stumps of trees are a curious feature in American travelling. The varying illusions they present to the unaccustomed eye as it grows dark are quite astonishing in their number and reality. Now there is a Grecian urn erected in the centre of a lonely field. Now there is a woman weeping at a tomb. Now a very commonplace old gentleman in a white waistcoat with a thumb thrust into each armhole of his coat. Now a student poring on a book now a crouching negro, now a horse, a dog, a cannon, an armed man, a hunchback throwing off his cloak and stepping forth into the light. They were often as entertaining to me as so many glasses and a magic lantern, and never took their shapes at my bidding, but seemed to force themselves upon me, whether I would or no. And strange to say I sometimes recognized in them counterparts of figures once familiar to me in pictures attached to childish books forgotten long ago. It soon became too dark, however, even for this amusement, and the trees were so close together that their dry branches rattled against the coach on either side, and obliged us all to keep our heads warm. It lightened, too, for three whole hours, each flash being very bright and blue and long, and as the vivid streaks came darting in among the crowded benches, and the thunder rolled gloomily above the treetops, one could scarcely help thinking that there were better neighbourhoods at such a time than thick woods afforded. At length, between ten and eleven o'clock at night, a few feeble lights appeared in the distance, and Upper Sandusky, an Indian village where we were to stay till morning, lay before us. They were gone to bed at the log inn, which was the only house of entertainment in the place, but soon answered to our knocking and got some tea for us in a sort of kitchen or common room, tapestried with old newspapers pasted against the wall. The bedchamber to which my wife and I were shown was a large, low, ghostly room, with a quantity of withered branches on the hearth, and two doors without any fastening opposite to each other, both opening on the black night and wild country, and so contrived that one of them always blew the other open, a novelty on domestic architecture, which I do not remember to have seen before, and which I was somewhat disconcerted to have forced on my attention after getting into bed, as I had a considerable sum in gold for our travelling expenses in my dressing-case. Some of the luggage, however piled against the panels, soon settled this difficulty, and my sleep would not have been much affected that night, I believe, though it had failed to do so. My Boston friend climbed up to bed, somewhere in the roof, where another guest was already snoring hugely. 
but being bitten beyond his power of endurance, he turned out again and fled for shelter to the coach, which was airing itself in front of the house. This was not a very politic step, as it turned out, for the pigs scenting him and looking upon the coach as a pie with some matter of meat inside, grunted round it so hideously that he was afraid to come out again, and lay there shivering till morning. Nor was it possible to warm him when he did come out, by means of a glass of brandy, for in Indian villages the legislature, with a very good and wise intention, forbids the sale of spirits by tavern-keepers. The precaution, however, is quite inefficacious, for the Indians never fail to procure liquor of a worse kind at a dearer price from travelling peddlers. It is a settlement of the Wyandot Indians who inhabit this place. Among the company at breakfast was a mild old gentleman who had been for many years employed by the United States government in conducting negotiations with the Indians, and who had just concluded a treaty with these people by which they bound themselves, in consideration of a certain annual sum, to remove next year to some land provided for them, west of the Mississippi, and a little way beyond St. Louis. He gave me a moving account of their strong attachment to the familiar scenes of their infancy, and in particular to the burial places of their kindred, and of their great reluctance to leave them. He has witnessed many such removals, and always with pain, though he knew that they departed for their own good. The question whether this tribe should go or stay had been discussed among them a day or two before, in a hut erected for that purpose, the logs of which still lay upon the ground before the inn. When the speaking was done, the eyes and nose were ranged on opposite sides, and every male adult voted in his turn. The moment the result was known, the minority, a large one, cheerfully yielded to the rest, and withdrew all kinds of opposition. We met some of these poor Indians afterwards, riding on shaggy ponies. They were so like the meaner sort of gypsies, that if I could have seen any of them in England, I should have concluded as a matter of course that they belonged to that wandering and restless people. Leaving this town directly after breakfast, we pushed forward again over a rather worse road than yesterday, if possible, and arrived about noon at Tiffin, where we parted with the extra. At two o'clock we took the railroad, the travelling on which was very slow, its construction being indifferent, and the ground wet and marshy, and arrived at Sandusky in time to dine that evening. We put up at a comfortable little hotel on the brink of Lake Erie, lay there that night, and had no choice but to wait there next day until a steamboat bound for Buffalo appeared. The town, which was sluggish and uninteresting enough, was something like the back of an English watering place out of the season. Our host, who was very attentive and anxious to make us comfortable, was a handsome middle-aged man who had come to this town from New England, in which part of the country he was raised. When I say that he constantly walked in and out of the room, with his hat on, and stopped to converse in the same free and easy state, and lay down on our sofa, and pulled his newspaper out of his pocket and read it at his ease, I merely mention these traits as characteristic of the country, not at all as being matter of complaint, or as having been disagreeable to me. I should undoubtedly be offended by such proceedings at home, because there they are not the custom, and where they are not they would be impertinences. But in America the only desire of a good-natured fellow of this kind is to treat his guests hospitably and well, and I had no more right, and I can truly say no more disposition, to measure his conduct by our English rule and standard, than I had to quarrel with him for not being of the exact stature which would qualify him for admission into the Queen's Grenadier Guards. As little inclination had I to find fault with a funny old lady who was an upper domestic in this establishment, and who, when she came to wait upon us at any meal, sat herself down comfortably in the most convenient chair, and producing a large pin to pick her teeth with, remained performing that ceremony, and steadfastly regarding us meanwhile with much gravity and composure, now and then pressing us to eat a little more, until it was time to clear away. It was enough for us that whatever we wished done was done with great civility and readiness, and a desire to oblige, not only here but everywhere else, and that all our wants were, in general, zealously anticipated. We were taking an early dinner at this house on the day after our arrival, which was Sunday, when a steamboat came in sight and presently touched at the wharf. As she proved to be on her way to Buffalo, we hurried on board with all speed, and soon left Sandusky far behind us. She was a large vessel of five hundred tons, and handsomely fitted up, though with high-pressure engines, which always conveyed that kind of feeling to me which I should be likely to experience, I think, if I had lodgings on the first floor of a powder-mill. 
She was laden with flour, some casks of which commodity were stored upon the deck. The captain, coming up to have a little conversation, and to introduce a friend, seated himself astride of one of these barrels, like a Bacchus of private life, and pulling a great clasp-knife out of his pocket, began to whittle it as he talked, by paring thin slices off the edges. And he whittled with such industry and hearty good will, that but for his being called away very soon, it must have disappeared bodily, and left nothing in its place but grist and shavings. After calling at one or two flat places, with low dams stretching out into the lake, whereon were stumpy lighthouses, like windmills without sails, the whole looking like a Dutch vignette, we came at midnight to Cleveland, where we lay all night until nine o'clock next morning. I entertained quite a curiosity in reference to this place, from having seen at Sandusky a specimen of its literature, in the shape of a newspaper, which was very strong indeed upon the subject of Lord Ashburton's recent arrival in Washington, to adjust the points in dispute between the United States Government and Great Britain, informing its readers that as America had whipped England in her infancy, and whipped her again in her youth, so it was clearly necessary she must whip her once again in her maturity and pledging its credit to all true Americans, that if Mr. Webster did his duty in the approaching negotiations, and sent the English lord home again in double-quick time, they should within two years sing Yankee Doodle in Hyde Park, and hail Columbia on the scarlet courts of Westminster. I found it a pretty town, and had the satisfaction of beholding the outside of the office of the journal from which I had just quoted. I did not enjoy the delight of seeing the wit who indicted the paragraph in question, but I have no doubt he is a prodigious man in his way, and held in high repute by a select circle. There was a gentleman on board to whom, as I unintentionally learned through the thin partition which divided our stateroom from the cabin in which he and his wife conversed together, I was unwittingly the occasion of very great uneasiness. I don't know why or wherefore, but I appear to run in his mind perpetually, and to dissatisfy him very much. First of all I heard him say— and the most ludicrous part of the business was that he said it in my very ear and could not have communicated more directly with me if he had leaned upon my shoulder and whispered me, "'Boz is on board still, my dear.' After a considerable pause, he added, complainingly, "'Boz keeps himself very close,' which was true enough, for I was not very well and was lying down with a book. I thought he had done with me after this, but I was deceived, for a long interval having elapsed, during which I imagined him to have been turning restlessly from side to side, and trying to go to sleep, he broke out again with, "'I suppose that Boz will be writing a book by and by and putting all our names in it,' at which imaginary consequence of being on board a boat with Boz, he groaned and became silent. We called at the town of Erie at eight o'clock that night, and lay there an hour. Between five and six next morning we arrived at Buffalo, where we breakfasted, and, being too near the Great Falls to wait patiently anywhere else, we set off by train the same morning at nine o'clock to Niagara. It was a miserable day, chilly and raw, a damp mist falling, and the trees in that northern region quite bare and wintry. Whenever the train halted I listened for the roar, and was constantly straining my eyes in the direction where I knew the falls must be, from seeing the river rolling on towards them, every moment expecting to behold the spray. Within a few minutes of our stopping, not before, I saw two great white clouds rising up slowly and majestically from the depths of the earth. That was all. At length we alighted, and then, for the first time, I heard the mighty rush of water, and felt the ground tremble underneath my feet. The bank is very steep, and was slippery with rain and half-melted ice. I hardly know how I got down, but I was soon at the bottom and climbing with two English officers who were crossing and had joined me over some broken rocks, deafened by the noise, half-blinded by the spray, and wet to the skin. We were at the foot of the American Fall. I could see an immense torrent of water tearing headlong down from some great height, but had no idea of shape or situation or anything but vague immensity. When we were seated in the little ferry-boat, and were crossing the swollen river immediately before both cataracts, I began to feel what it was. But I was in a manner stunned, and unable to comprehend the vastness of the sea. It was not until I came on Table Rock and looked, great heaven, on what a fall of bright green water, that it came upon me in its full might and majesty. Then, when I felt how near to my Creator I was standing, the first effect and the enduring one, instant and lasting, of the tremendous spectacle was peace. 
peace of mind, tranquillity, calm recollections of the dead, great thoughts of eternal rest and happiness, nothing of gloom or terror. Niagara was at once stamped upon my heart, an image of beauty to remain there, changeless and indelible, until its pulses ceased to beat for ever. Oh, how the strife and trouble of daily life receded from my view, and lessened in the distance, during the ten memorable days we passed on that enchanted ground! What voices spoke from out the thundering water, what faces faded from the earth, looked out upon me from its gleaming depths, what heavenly promise glistened in those angels' tears, the drops of many hues that showered around and twined themselves about the gorgeous arches which the changing rainbows made! I never stirred in all that time from the Canadian side, whither I had gone at first. I never crossed the river again, for I knew there were people on the other shore, and in such a place it is natural to shun strange company. To wander to and fro all day, and see the cataracts from all points of view, and to stand upon the edge of the great horseshoe fall, marking the hurried water gathering strength as it approached the verge, yet seeming, too, to pause before it shot into the gulf below to gaze from the river's level up at the torrent as it came streaming down, to climb the neighbouring heights and watch it through the trees, and see the wreathing water and the rapids hurrying on to take its fearful plunge, to linger in the shadow of the solemn rocks three miles below, watching the river as, stirred by no visible cause, it heaved and eddied and awoke the echoes, being troubled yet far down beneath the surface by its giant leap to have Niagara before me, lighted by the sun and by the moon, red in the day's decline, and grey as evening slowly fell upon it, to look upon it every day, and wake up in the night and hear its ceaseless voice. This was enough. I think in every quiet season now, still do those waters roll and leap, and roar and tumble all day long. Still are the rainbows spanning them a hundred feet below, Still, when the sun is on them, do they shine and glow like molten gold. Still, when the day is gloomy, do they fall like snow, or seem to crumble away like the front of a great chalk cliff, or roll down the rock like dense white smoke. But always does the mighty stream appear to die as it comes down, and always from its unfathomable grave arises that tremendous ghost of spray and mist which is never laid which has haunted this place with the same dread solemnity since darkness brooded on the deep, and that first flood before the deluge, light, came rushing on creation at the word of God. End of chapter 14American Notes by Charles Dickens, Chapter 15 In Canada, Toronto, Kingston, Montreal, Quebec, St. John's In the United States again, Lebanon, the Shaker Village, West Point I wish to abstain from instituting any comparison, or drawing any parallel whatever, between the social features of the United States and those of the British possessions in Canada. For this reason, I shall confine myself to a very brief account of our journeyings in the latter territory. But before I leave Niagara, I must advert to one disgusting circumstance which can hardly have escaped the observation of any decent traveller who has visited the falls. On Table Rock there is a cottage belonging to a guide where little relics of the place are sold, and where visitors register their names in a book kept for the purpose. On the wall of the room, in which a great many of these volumes are preserved, the following request is posted. Visitors will please not copy or extract the remarks and poetical effusions from the registers and albums kept here. But for this intimation, I should have let them lie upon the tables on which they were strewn with careful negligence, like books in a drawing-room being quite satisfied with the stupendous silliness of certain stanzas with an anticlimax at the end of each, which were framed and hung up on the wall. Curious, however, after reading this announcement, to see what kind of morsels were so carefully preserved, I turned a few leaves and found them scrawled all over with the vilest and filthiest ribaldry that ever human hogs delighted in. 
It is humiliating enough to know that there are among men brutes so obscene and worthless that they can delight in laying these miserable profanations upon the very steps of nature's greatest altar, but that these should be hoarded up for the delight of their fellow swine, and kept in a public place where any eyes may see them, is a disgrace to the English language in which they are written, though I hope few of these entries have been made by Englishmen, and a reproach to the English side on which they are preserved. The quarters of our soldiers at Niagara are finely and airily situated. Some of them are large detached houses, on the plain above the falls, which were originally designed for hotels, and in the evening time, when the women and children are leaning over the balconies, watching the men as they played at ball and other games upon the grass before the door, they often presented a little picture of cheerfulness and animation which made it quite a pleasure to pass that way. At any garrisoned point where the line of demarcation between one country and another is so very narrow as at Niagara, desertion from the ranks can scarcely fail to be of frequent occurrence, and it may be reasonably supposed that when the soldiers entertain the wildest and maddest hopes of the fortune and independence that await them on the other side, the impulse to play traitor, which such a place suggests to dishonest minds, is not weakened. But it very rarely happens that the men who do desert are happy or contented afterwards, and many instances have been known in which they have confessed their grievous disappointment and their earnest desire to return to their old service if they could but be assured of pardon or lenient treatment. Many of their comrades, notwithstanding, do the like from time to time, and instances of loss of life in the effort to cross the river with that object are far from being uncommon. Several men were drowned in the attempt to swim across not long ago, and one, who had the madness to trust himself upon a table as a raft, was swept down to the whirlpool, where his mangled body eddied round and round some days. I am inclined to think that the noise of the falls is very much exaggerated, and this will appear the more probable when the depth of the great basin in which the water is received is taken into account. At no time during our stay there was the wind at all high or boisterous, but we never heard them three miles off, even at the very quiet time of sunset, although we often tried. Queenston, at which place the steamboats start for Toronto, or, I should rather say, at which place they call, for their wharf is at Lewiston, on the opposite shore, is situated in a delicious valley, through which the Niagara River, in colour of very deep green, pursues its course. It is approached by a road that takes its winding way among the heights by which the town is sheltered, and seen from this point is extremely beautiful and picturesque. On the most conspicuous of these heights stood a monument erected by the provincial legislature in memory of General Brock, who was slain in a battle with the American forces after having won the victory. Some vagabond, supposed to be a fellow of the name of Lett, who is now, or who lately was in prison as a felon, blew up this monument two years ago, and it is now a melancholy ruin, with a long fragment of iron railing hanging dejectedly from its top, and waving to and fro like a wild ivy branch or broken vine-stem. It is of much higher importance than it may seem that this statue should be repaired at the public cost, as it ought to have been long ago. Firstly, because it is beneath the dignity of England to allow a memorial raised in honour of one of her defenders to remain in this condition on the very spot where he died. Secondly, because the sight of it in its present state, and the recollection of the unpunished outrage which brought it to this pass, is not very likely to soothe down border feelings among English subjects here, or compose their border quarrels and dislikes. I was standing on the wharf at this place, watching the passengers embarking in a steamboat which preceded that whose coming we awaited, and participating in the anxiety with which a sergeant's wife was collecting her few goods together, keeping one distracted eye hard upon the porters, who were hurrying them on board, and the other on a hoopless washing-tub for which, as being the most utterly worthless of all her movables, she seemed to entertain particular affection when three or four soldiers with a recruit came up and went on board. The recruit was a likely young fellow enough, strongly built and well made, but by no means sober. Indeed, he had all the air of a man who had been more or less drunk for some days. He carried a small bundle over his shoulder, slung at the end of a walking-stick, and had a short pipe in his mouth. 
He was as dusty and dirty as recruits usually are, and his shoes betokened that he had travelled on foot some distance, but he was in a very jocose state, and shook hands with this soldier and clapped that one on the back and talked and laughed continually like a roaring idle dog as he was. The soldiers rather laughed at this blade than with him, seeming to say, as they stood straightening their canes in their hands and looking coolly at him over their glazed stalks, "'Go on, my boy, while you may. You'll know better by and by.' When suddenly the novice, who had been backing towards the gangway in his noisy merriment, fell overboard before their eyes and splashed heavily down into the river between the vessel and the dock. I never saw such a good thing as this change that came over these soldiers in an instant. Almost before the man was down, their professional manner, their stiffness and constraint were gone, and they were filled with the most violent energy. In less time than is required to tell it, they had him out again, feet first, with the tails of his coat flapping over his eyes, everything about him hanging the wrong way, and the water streaming off at every thread in his threadbare dress. But the moment they set him upright and found that he was none the worse, they were soldiers again, looking over their glazed stocks more composedly than ever. The half-sobered recruit glanced round for a moment, as if his first impulse was to express some gratitude for his preservation. But seeing them with this air of total unconcern, and having his wet pipe presented to him with an oath by the soldier who had been by far the most anxious of the party, he stuck it in his mouth, thrust his hands into his moist pockets, and without even shaking the water off his clothes, walked on board whistling, not to say as if nothing happened, but as if he had meant to do it, and it had been a perfect success. Our steamboat came up directly this had left the wharf, and soon bore us to the mouth of the Niagara, where the stars and stripes of America flutter on one side, and the Union Jack of England on the other, and so narrow is the space between them that the sentinels in either fort can often hear the watchword of the other country given. Thence we emerged on Lake Ontario, an inland sea, and by half-past six o'clock were at Toronto. The country round this town, being very flat, is bare of scenic interest, but the town itself is full of life and motion, bustle, business, and improvement. The streets are well paved and lighted with gas, the houses are large and good, the shops excellent, many of them have a display of goods in their windows, such as may be seen in thriving country towns in England, and there are some which would do no discredit to the metropolis itself. There is a good stone prison here, and there are, besides a handsome church, a courthouse, public offices, many commodious private residences, and a government observatory for noting and recording the magnetic variations. In the College of Upper Canada, which is one of the public establishments of the city, a sound education in every department of polite learning can be had, at a very moderate expense, the annual charge for the instruction of each pupil not exceeding nine pounds sterling. It has pretty good endowments on the way of land, and is a valuable and useful institution. The first stone of a new college had been laid but a few days before by the Governor-General. It will be a handsome, spacious edifice, approached by a long avenue which is already planted and made available as a public walk. The town is well adapted for wholesome exercise at all seasons, for the footways in the thoroughfares which lie beyond the principal street are planked like floors and kept in very good and clean repair. It is a matter of deep regret that political differences should have run high in this place, and led to most discreditable and disgraceful results. It is not long since guns were discharged from a window in this town at the successful candidates in an election, and the coachman of one of them was actually shot in the body, though not dangerously wounded. But one man was killed on the same occasion, and from the very window whence he received his death, the very flag which shielded his murderer, not only in the commission of the crime but from its consequences, was displayed again on the occasion of the public ceremony performed by the Governor-General to which I have just adverted. Of all the colours in the rainbow, there is but one which could be so employed. I need not say that flag was orange. The time of leaving Toronto for Kingston is noon. By eight o'clock next morning, the traveller is at the end of his journey, which is performed by a steamboat upon Lake Ontario, calling at Port Hope and Coburg, the latter a cheerful, thriving little town. Vast quantities of flour form the chief item in the freight of these vessels. We had no fewer than one thousand and eighty barrels on board between Coburg and Kingston. 
the latter place, which is now the seat of government in Canada, is a very poor town, rendered still poorer in the appearance of its market-place by the ravages of a recent fire. Indeed, it may be said of Kingston that one half of it appears to be burnt down and the other half not to be built up. The government-house is neither elegant nor commodious, yet it is almost the only house of any importance in the neighbourhood. There is an admirable jail here, well and wisely governed, and excellently regulated in every respect. The men were employed as shoemakers, rope-makers, blacksmiths, tailors, carpenters, and stone-cutters, and in building a new prison which was pretty far advanced towards completion. The female prisoners were occupied in needlework. Among them was a beautiful girl of twenty who had been there nearly three years. She acted as bearer of secret dispatches for the self-styled patriots on Navy Island during the Canadian insurrection, sometimes dressing as a girl, and carrying them in her stays, sometimes attiring herself as a boy, and secreting them in the lining of her hat. In the latter character she always rode as a boy would, which was nothing to her, for she could govern any horse that any man could ride, and could drive four in hand with the best whip in those parts. Setting forth on one of her patriotic missions, she appropriated to herself the first horse she could lay her hands on, and this offence had brought her where I saw her. She had quite a lovely face, though, as the reader may suppose from this sketch of her history, there was a lurking devil in her bright eyes which looked out pretty sharply from between her prison bars. There is a bomb-proof fort here of great strength, which occupies a bold position, and is capable, doubtless, of doing good service, though the town is much too close upon the frontier to be long held, I should imagine, for its present purpose in troubled times. There is also a small navy-yard where a couple of government steamboats were building, and getting on vigorously. We left Kingston for Montreal on the 10th of May, at half-past nine in the morning, and proceeded in a steamboat down the St. Lawrence River. The beauty of this noble stream at almost any point, but especially in the commencement of this journey, when it winds its way among the thousand islands, can hardly be imagined. The number and constant successions of these islands, all green and richly wooded, their fluctuating sizes, some so large that for half an hour together one among them will appear as the opposite bank of the river, and some so small that they are mere dimples on its broad bosom, their infinite variety of shapes, and the numberless combinations of beautiful forms which the trees growing on them present, all form a picture fraught with uncommon interest and pleasure. In the afternoon we shot down some rapids where the river boiled and bubbled strangely, and where the force and headlong violence of the current were tremendous. At seven o'clock we reached Dickinson's Landing, whence travellers proceed for two or three hours by stagecoach, the navigation of the river being rendered so dangerous and difficult in the interval by rapids that steamboats do not make the passage. The number and length of these portages, over which the roads are bad and the travelling slow, render the way between the towns of Montreal and Kingston somewhat tedious. Our course lay over a wide, unenclosed tract of country at a little distance from the riverside, whence the bright warning lights on the dangerous parts of the St. Lawrence shone vividly. The night was dark and raw, and the way dreary enough. It was nearly ten o'clock when we reached the wharf where the next steamboat lay, and went on board and to bed. She lay there all night, and started as soon as it was day. The morning was ushered in by a violent thunderstorm, and was very wet, but gradually improved and brightened up. Going on deck after breakfast I was amazed to see floating down with a stream a most gigantic raft with some thirty or forty wooden houses upon it, and at least as many flag-masks, so that it looked like a nautical street. I saw many of these rafts afterwards, but never one so large. All the timber, or lumber as it is called in America, which is brought down the St. Lawrence, is floated down in this manner. When the raft reaches its place of destination, it is broken up, the materials are sold, and the boatmen return for more. At eight we landed again, and travelled by a stagecoach for four hours through a pleasant and well-cultivated country, perfectly French in every respect, in the appearance of the cottages, the air, language, and dress of the peasantry, the signboards on the shops and taverns, and the virgin's shrines and crosses by the wayside. Nearly every common labourer and boy, though he had no shoes to his feet, wore round his waist a sash of some bright colour, generally red, and the women, who were working in the fields and gardens and doing all kinds of husbandry, wore, one and all, great flat straw hats with most capacious brims. 
There were Catholic priests and sisters of charity in the village streets, and images of the Saviour at the corners of crossroads and in other public places. At noon we went on board another steamboat and reached the village of Lachine, nine miles from Montreal, by three o'clock. There we left the river and went on by land. Montreal is pleasantly situated on the margin of the St. Lawrence, and is backed by some bold heights about which there are charming rides and drives. The streets are generally narrow and irregular, as in most French towns of any age, but in the more modern parts of the city they are wide and airy. They display a great variety of very good shops, and both in the town and suburbs there are many excellent private dwellings. The granite quays are remarkable for their beauty, solidity, and extent. There is a very large Catholic cathedral here, recently erected with two tall spires, of which one is yet unfinished. In the open space in front of this edifice stands a solitary grim-looking square brick tower, which has a quaint and remarkable appearance, and which the wiseacres of the place have consequently determined to pull down immediately. The government house is very superior to that at Kingston, and the town is full of life and bustle. In one of the suburbs is a plank road, not footpath, five or six miles long, and a famous road it is, too. All the rides in this vicinity were made doubly interesting by the bursting out of spring, which is here so rapid that it is but a day's leap from barren winter to the blooming youth of summer. The steamboats to Quebec perform the journey in the night. That is to say, they leave Montreal at six in the evening, and arrive in Quebec at six next morning. We made this excursion during our stay in Montreal, which exceeded a fortnight, and were charmed by its interest and beauty. The impression made upon the visitor by this Gibraltar of America, its giddy heights, its citadel suspended as it were in the air, its picturesque steep streets and frowning gateways, and the splendid views which burst upon the eye at every turn, is at once unique and lasting. It is a place not to be forgotten or mixed up in the mind with other places, or altered for a moment in the crowd of scenes a traveller can recall. Apart from the realities of this most picturesque city, there are associations clustered about it which would make a desert rich in interest. The dangerous precipice along whose rocky front Wolfe and his brave companions climbed to glory, the plains of Abraham where he received his mortal wound, the fortress so chivalrously defended by Montcalm, and his soldier's grave dug for him while yet alive, by the bursting of a shell, are not the least among them, or among the gallant incidents of history. That is a noble monument, too, and worthy of two great nations, which perpetuates the memory of both brave generals, and on which their names are jointly written. The city is rich in public institutions and in Catholic churches and charities, but it is mainly in the prospect from the sight of the old government house and from the citadel that its surpassing beauty lies. The exquisite expanse of country, rich in field and forest, mountain height and water, which lies stretched out before the view, with miles of Canadian villages glancing in long white streaks, like veins along the landscape, the motley crowd of gables, roofs, and chimney-tops in the old hilly town immediately at hand, the beautiful St. Lawrence sparkling and flashing in the sunlight, and the tiny ships below the rock from which you gaze, whose distant rigging looks like spiders' webs against the light, while casks and barrels on their decks dwindle into toys, and busy mariners become so many puppets, all this framed by a sunken window in the fortress, and looked at from the shadowed room within, forms one of the brightest and most enchanting pictures that the eye can rest upon. In the spring of the year, Vast numbers of emigrants who have newly arrived from England or from Ireland pass between Quebec and Montreal on their way to the backwoods and new settlements of Canada. If it be an entertaining lounge, as I very often found it, to take a morning stroll upon the quay at Montreal, and see them grouped in hundreds on the public wharfs about their chests and boxes, it is a matter of deep interest to be their fellow passenger on one of these steamboats, and mingling with the concourse, see and hear them unobserved. The vessel in which we returned from Quebec to Montreal was crowded with them, and at night they spread their beds between decks, those who had beds, at least, and slept so close and thick about our cabin door that the passage to and fro was quite blocked up. They were nearly all English, from Gloucestershire the greater part, and had had a long winter passage out, but it was wonderful to see how clean the children had been kept, and how untiring in their love and self-denial all the poor parents were. 
Can't as we may, and as we shall to the end of things, it is very much harder for the poor to be virtuous than it is for the rich, and the good that is in them shines the brighter for it. In many a noble mansion lives a man, the best of husbands and of fathers, whose private worth in both capacities is justly lauded to the skies. But bring him here, upon this crowded deck, strip from his fair young wife her silken dress and jewels, unbind her braided hair, stamp early wrinkles on her brow, pinch her pale cheek with care and much privation, array her faded form in coarsely patched attire, let there be nothing but his love to set her forth or deck her out, and you shall put it to the proof indeed. So change his station in the world, that he shall see in those young things who climb about his knee not records of his wealth and name, but little wrestlers with him for his daily bread, so many poachers on his scanty meal, so many units to divide his every sum of comfort, and farther to reduce its small amount. In lieu of the endearments of childhood in its sweetest aspect, heap upon him all his pains and wants, its sicknesses and ills, its fretfulness, caprice, and querulous endurance. Let its prattle be not of engaging infant fancies, but of cold and thirst and hunger. And if his fatherly affection outlive all this, and he be patient, watchful, tender, careful of his children's lives, and mindful always of their joys and sorrows, then send him back to Parliament and pulpit and quarter sessions, and when he hears fine talk of the depravity of those who live from hand to mouth, and labour hard to do it, let him speak up as one who knows, and tell those holders forth, that they, by parallel with such a class, should be high angels in their daily lives, and lay but humble siege to heaven at last. Which of us shall say what he would be, if such realities, with small relief or change all through his days, were his? Looking round upon these people, far from home, houseless, indigent, wandering, weary with travel and hard living, and seeing how patiently they nursed and tended their young children, how they consulted ever their wants first, then half supplied their own, what gentle ministers of hope and faith the women were, how the men profited by their example, and how very, very seldom even a moment's petulance or harsh complaint broke out among them, I felt a stronger love and honour of my kind come glowing on my heart, and wished to God there had been many atheists in the better part of human nature there, to read this simple lesson in the book of life. We left Montreal for New York again on the 30th of May, crossing to La Prairie on the opposite shore of the St. Lawrence in a steamboat. We then took the railroad to St. John's, which is on the brink of Lake Champlain. Our last greeting in Canada was from the English officers in the pleasant barracks at that place, a class of gentlemen who had made every hour of our visit memorable by their hospitality and friendship, and with rule Britannia sounding in our ears, soon left it far behind. But Canada has held, and always will remain, a foremost place in my remembrance. Few Englishmen are prepared to find it what it is. Advancing quietly, old differences settling down, and being fast forgotten, public feeling and private enterprise alike, in a sound and wholesome state, nothing of flush or fever in its system, but health and vigour throbbing in its steady pulse, it is full of hope and promise. To me, who had been accustomed to think of it as something left behind in the strides of advancing society, as something neglected and forgotten, slumbering and wasting in its sleep. The demand for labour and the rates of wages, the busy quays of Montreal, the vessels taking in their cargoes and discharging them, the amount of shipping in the different ports, the commerce, roads, and public works, all made to last. The respectability and character of the public journals, and the amount of rational comfort and happiness which honest industry may earn, were very great surprises. The steamboats on the lakes and their conveniences, cleanliness and safety, in the gentlemanly character and bearing of their captains, and in the politeness and perfect comfort of their social regulations, are unsurpassed even by the famous Scotch vessels, deservedly so much esteemed at home. The inns are usually bad, because the custom of boarding at hotels is not so general here as in the States, and the British officers, who form a large portion of the society of every town, live chiefly at the regimental messes, 
but in every other respect the traveller in Canada will find as good provision for his comfort as in any place I know. There is one American boat, the vessel which carried us on Lake Champlain from St. John's to Whitehall, which I praise very highly, but no more than it deserves, when I say that it is superior even to that in which we went from Queenston to Toronto, or to that in which we travelled from the latter place to Kingston, or, I have no doubt, I may add to any other in the world. The steamboat, which is called the Burlington, is a perfectly exquisite achievement of neatness, elegance, and order. The decks are drawing-rooms, the cabins are boudoirs, choicely furnished and adorned with prints, pictures, and musical instruments. Every nook and corner in the vessel is a perfect curiosity of graceful comfort and beautiful contrivance. Captain Sherman, her commander, to whose ingenuity and excellent taste these results are solely attributable, has bravely and worthily distinguished himself on more than one trying occasion, not least among them, in having the moral courage to carry British troops, at a time, during the Canadian rebellion, when no other conveyance was open to them. He and his vessel are held in universal respect, both by his own countrymen and ours, and no man ever enjoyed the popular esteem who, in his sphere of action, won and wore it better than this gentleman. By means of this floating palace we were soon in the United States again, and called that evening at Burlington, a pretty town where we lay an hour or so. We reached Whitehall, where we were to disembark, at six next morning, and might have done so earlier, but that these steamboats lie for some hours in the night, in consequence of the lake becoming very narrow at that part of the journey, and difficult of navigation in the dark. Its width is so contracted at one point, indeed, that they are obliged to warp round by means of a rope. After breakfasting at Whitehall, we took the stage-coach for Albany, a large and busy town, where we arrived between five and six o'clock that afternoon, after a very hot day's journey for we were now in the height of summer again. At seven we started for New York on board a great North River steamboat, which was so crowded with passengers that the upper deck was like the box lobby of a theatre between the pieces, and the lower one like Tottingham Court Road on a Saturday night. But we slept soundly, notwithstanding, and soon after five o'clock next morning reached New York. Tarrying here only that day and night to recruit after our late fatigues, we started off once more upon our last journey in America. We had yet five days to spare before embarking for England, and I had a great desire to see the Shaker village, which is peopled by a religious sect from whom it takes its name. To this end, we went up the North River again, as far as the town of Hudson, and there hired an extra to carry us to Lebanon thirty miles distant, and, of course, another and a different Lebanon from that village where I slept on the night of the prairie trip. The country through which the road meandered was rich and beautiful, the weather very fine, and for many miles the Catskill Mountains, where Rip Van Winkle and the ghostly Dutchman played at ninepence one memorable gusty afternoon, towered in the blue distance like stately clouds. At one point, as we ascended a steep hill, athwart whose base a railroad, yet constructing, took its course, we came upon an Irish colony. With means at hand of building decent cabins, it was wonderful to see how clumsy, rough, and wretched its hovels were. The best were poor protection from the weather, the worst let in the wind and rain through wide breaches in the roof of sodden grass, and in the walls of mud. Some had neither door nor window, some had nearly fallen down, and were imperfectly propped up by stakes and poles. All were ruinous and filthy. Hideously ugly old women and very buxom young ones, pigs, dogs, men, children, babies, pots, kettles, dunghills, vile refuge, rank straw, and standing water, all wallowing together in an inseparable heap, composed the furniture of every dark and dirty hut. Between nine and ten o'clock at night we arrived at Lebanon, which is renowned for its warm baths and for a great hotel well adapted, I have no doubt, to the gregarious taste of those seekers after health and pleasure who repair here, but inexpressibly comfortless to me. We were shown into an immense apartment lighted by two dim candles called the drawing-room, from which there was a descent by a flight of steps to another vast desert called the dining-room. Our bedchambers were almost certain long rows of little whitewashed cells, which opened from either side of a dreary passage, and were so like rooms in a prison 
that I half expected to be locked up when I went to bed, and listened involuntarily for the turning of the key on the outside. There need be baths somewhere in the neighbourhood, for the other washing arrangements were on as limited a scale as I ever saw, even in America. Indeed, these bedrooms were so very bare of even such common luxuries as chairs, that I should say they were not provided with enough of anything, but that I bethink myself of our having been most bountifully bitten all night. The house is very pleasantly situated, however, and we had a good breakfast. That done, we went to visit our place of destination, which was some two miles off, and the way to which was soon indicated by a finger-post whereon was painted to the Shaker village. As we rode along, we passed a party of Shakers, who were at work upon the road, who wore the broadest of all broad-brimmed hats, and were in all visible respects such very wooden men that I felt about as much sympathy for them and as much interest in them as if they had been so many figureheads of ships. Presently we came to the beginning of the village, and alighting at the door of a house where the Shaker manufacturers are sold, and which is the headquarters of the elders, requested permission to see the Shaker worship. Pending the conveyance of this request to some person in authority, we walked into a grim room, where several grim hats were hanging on grim pegs, and the time was grimly told by a grim clock which uttered every tick with a kind of struggle, as if it broke the grim silence reluctantly and under protest. Ranged against the wall were six or eight stiff high-backed chairs, and they partook so strongly of the general grimness that one would much rather have sat on the floor than incurred the smallest obligation to any of them. Presently there stalked into this apartment a grim old shaker, with eyes as hard and dull and cold as the great round metal buttons on his coat and waistcoat, a sort of calm goblin. Being informed of our desire, he produced a newspaper wherein the body of elders, whereof he was a member, had advertised but a few days before that in consequence of certain unseemly interruptions which their worship had received from strangers, their chapel was closed to the public for the space of one year. As nothing was to be urged in opposition to this reasonable arrangement, we requested leave to make some trifling purchase of Shaker goods, which was grimly conceded. We accordingly repaired to a store in the same house, and on the opposite side of the passage, where the stock was presided over by something alive in a russet case, which the elder said was a woman, and which I suppose was a woman, though I should not have suspected it. On the opposite side of the road was their place of worship, a cool, clean edifice of wood, with large windows and green blinds, like a spacious summer-house. As there was no getting into this place, and nothing was to be done but walk up and down and look at it, and the other buildings in the village, which were chiefly of wood, painted a dark red like English barns, and composed of many stories like English factories, I have nothing to communicate to the reader beyond the scanty results I gleaned the while our purchases were making. These people are called shakers from their peculiar form of adoration, which consists of a dance performed by the men and women of all ages, who arrange themselves for that purpose in opposite parties, the men first divesting themselves of their hats and coats, which they gravely hang against the wall before they begin, and tying a ribbon round their shirt-sleeves as though they were going to be bled. They accompany themselves with a droning humming noise, and dance until they are quite exhausted, alternately advancing and retiring in a preposterous sort of trot. The effect is said to be unspeakably absurd, and if I may judge from a print of this ceremony which I have in my possession, and which I am informed by those who have visited the chapel as perfectly accurate, it must be infinitely grotesque. They are governed by a woman, and her rule is understood to be absolute, though she has the assistance of a council of elders. She lives, it is said, in strict seclusion in certain rooms above the chapel, and is never shown to profane eyes. If she at all resemble the lady who presided over the store, it is a great charity to keep her as close as possible, and I cannot too strongly express my perfect concurrence in this benevolent proceeding. All the possessions and revenues of the settlement are thrown into a common stock, which is managed by the elders. As they have made converts among people who were well-to-do in the world, and are frugal and thrifty, it is understood that this fund prospers, the more especially as they have made large purchases of land. Nor is this at Lebanon the only Shaker settlement. There are, I think, at least three others. They are good farmers, and all their produce is eagerly purchased and highly esteemed. 
shaker seeds shaker herbs and shaker distilled waters are commonly announced for sale in the shops of towns and cities they are good breeders of cattle and are kind and merciful to the brute creation consequently shaker beasts seldom fail to find a ready market they eat and drink together after the spartan model at a great public table there is no union of the sexes and every shaker male and female is devoted to a life of celibacy rumour has been busy upon this theme but here again i must refer to the lady of the store and say that if many of the sister shakers resemble her i treat all such slander as bearing on its face the strongest marks of wild improbability but that they take as proselytes persons so young that they cannot know their own minds and cannot possess much strength of resolution in this or any other respect i can assert from my own observation of this extreme juvenility of certain youthful shakers whom i saw at work among the party on the road they are said to be good drivers of bargains but to be honest and just in their transactions and even in horse-dealing to resist those thievish tendencies which would seem for some undiscovered reason to be almost inseparable from that branch of traffic in all matters they hold their own course quietly live in their gloomy silent commonwealth and show little desire to interfere with other people this is well enough but nevertheless i cannot i confess incline towards the shakers view them with much favour or extend towards them any very lenient construction i so abhor and from my soul detest that bad spirit no matter by what class or sect it may be entertained which would strip life of its healthful graces rob youth of its innocent pleasures pluck from maturity and age their pleasant ornaments and make existence but a narrow path towards the grave that odious spirit which if it could have had full scope and sway upon the earth must have blasted and made barren the imaginations of the greatest men and left them in their power of raising up enduring images before their fellow-creatures yet unborn no better than the beasts that in these very broad-brimmed hats and very sombre coats in stiff-necked solemn-visaged piety in short no matter what its garb whether it hath cropped hair as in a shaker village or long nails as in a hoodoo temple i recognize the worst among the enemies of heaven and earth who turn the water at the marriage feasts of this poor world not into wine but gall and if there must be people vowed to crush the harmless fancies and the love of innocent delights and gaieties which are a part of human nature as much a part of it as any other love or hope that is our common portion let them for me stand openly revealed among the ribald and licentious the very idiots know that they are not on the immortal road and will despise them and avoid them readily leaving the shaker village with a hearty dislike of the old shakers and a hearty pity for the young ones tempered by the strong probability of their running away as they grow older and wiser which they not uncommonly do we returned to lebanon and so to hudson by the way we had come upon the previous day there we took the steamboat down the north river towards new york but stopped some four hours journey short of it at west point where we remained the night and all next day and next night too in this beautiful place the fairest among the fair and lovely highlands of the north river shut in by deep green heights and ruined forts and looking down the distant town of newburgh upon a glittering path of sunlit water with here and there a skiff whose white sail often bends on some new tack as sudden flaws of wind come down upon her from the gullies and the hills hemmed in besides all round with memories of washington and events of the revolutionary war is the military school of america it could not stand on more appropriate ground and any ground more beautiful can hardly be the course of education is severe but well devised and manly through june july and august the young men encamp upon the spacious plain whereon the college stands and all the year their military exercises are performed there daily the term of study at this institution which the state requires from all cadets is four years but whether it be from the rigid nature of the discipline or the national impatience of restraint or both causes combined not more than half the number who begin their studies here ever remain to finish them the number of cadets being about equal to that of the members of congress one is sent here from every congressional district its member influencing the selection commissions in the service are distributed on the same principle 
the dwellings of the various professors are beautifully situated, and there is a most excellent hotel for strangers, though it had the two drawbacks of being a total abstinence house, wines and spirits being forbidden to the students, and of serving the public meals at rather uncomfortable hours, to wit, breakfast at seven, dinner at one, and supper at sunset. The beauty and freshness of this calm retreat, in the very dawn and greenness of summer, it was then the beginning of June, were exquisite indeed. Leaving it upon the sixth, and returning to New York, to embark for England on the succeeding day, I was glad to think that among the last memorable beauties which had glided past us, and softened in the bright perspective, were those whose pictures, traced by no common hand, are fresh in most men's minds, not easily to grow old, or fade beneath the dust of time, the Catskill Mountains, Sleepy Hollow, and the Tappan Zee. End of chapter 15《American Notes》Chapter 16 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Brad Philippone. — American Notes by Charles Dickens Chapter 16 The Passage Home I never had so much interest before, and very likely I shall never have so much interest again, in the state of the wind as on the long-looked-for morning of Tuesday the 7th of June. Some nautical authority had told me, a day or two previous, anything with west in it will do. So when I darted out of bed at daylight, and throwing up the window, was saluted by a lively breeze from the northwest which had sprung up in the night, it came upon me so freshly, rustling with so many happy associations, that I conceived upon the spot a special regard for all airs blowing from that quarter of the compass, which I shall cherish, I dare say, until my own wind has breathed its last frail puff, and withdrawn itself for ever from the mortal calendar. The pilot had not been slow to take advantage of this favourable weather, and the ship, which yesterday had been in such a crowded dock that she might have retired from trade for good and all, for any chance she seemed to have of going to sea, was now full sixteen miles away. A gallant sight she was, when we, first gaining on her in a steamboat, saw her in the distance riding at anchor, her tall masts pointing up in graceful lines against the sky, and every rope and spar expressed in delicate and thread-like outline, gallant too, when, we being all aboard, the anchor came up to the steady chorus, cheerily men, oh cheerily, and she followed proudly in the towing steamboat's wake, but bravest and most gallant of all, when the tow-rope being cast adrift, the canvas fluttered from her masts, and spreading her white wing she soared away upon her free and solitary course. In the after-cabin we were only fifteen passengers in all, and the greater part were from Canada, where some of us had known each other. The night was rough and squally, so were the next two days, but they flew by quickly, and we were soon as cheerful and snug a party, with an honest, manly-hearted captain at our head, as ever came to the resolution of being mutually agreeable on land or water. We breakfasted at eight, lunched at twelve, dined at three, and took our tea at half-past seven. We had abundance of amusements, and dinner was not the least among them, firstly, for its own sake, secondly, because of its extraordinary length, its duration, inclusive of all the long pauses between the courses, being seldom less than two hours and a half, which was a subject of never-failing entertainment. By way of beguiling the tediousness of these banquets, a select association was formed at the lower end of the table, below the mast, to whose distinguished president modesty forbids me to make any further allusion, which, being a very hilarious and jovial institution, was, prejudice apart, in high favour with the rest of the community, and particularly with a black steward, who lived for three weeks in a broad grin at the marvellous humour of these incorporated worthies. Then we had chess for those who played it, whist, cribbage, books, backgammon, and shovelboard. In all weathers, fair or foul, calm or windy, we were every one on deck walking up and down in pairs, lying in the boats, leaning over the side, or chatting in a lazy group together. 
we had no lack of music, for one played the accordion, another the violin, and another, who usually began at six o'clock a.m., the key bugle, the combined effort of which instruments, when they all played different tunes in different parts of the ship, at the same time, and within hearing of each other, as they sometimes did, everybody being intensely satisfied with his own performance, was sublimely hideous. When all these means of entertainment failed, a sail would heave in sight, looming perhaps the very spirit of a ship, in the misty distance, or passing us so close that through our glasses we could see the people on her decks, and easily make out her name and whither she was bound. For hours together we could watch the dolphins and porpoises as they rolled and leaped and dived around the vessel, or those small creatures ever on the wing, the mother carries chickens, which had borne us company from New York Bay, and for a whole fortnight fluttered about the vessel's stern. For some days we had a dead calm, or very light winds, during which the crew amused themselves with fishing, and hooked an unlucky dolphin, who expired in all her rainbow colours on the deck, an event of such importance in our barren calendar, that afterwards we dated from the dolphin, and made the day on which he died an era. Besides all this, when we were five or six days out, there began to be much talk of icebergs, of which wandering islands an unusual number had been seen by the vessels that had come into New York a day or two before we left that port, and of whose dangerous neighbourhood we were warned by the sudden coldness of the weather, and the sinking of the mercury in the barometer. While these tokens lasted, a double lookout was kept, and many dismal tales were whispered after dark of ships that had struck upon the ice and gone down in the night, but the wind obliging us to hold a southward course, we saw none of them, and the weather soon grew bright and warm again. The observation every day at noon, and the subsequent working of the vessel's course, was, as may be supposed, a feature in our lives of paramount importance, nor were there wanting, as there never are, sagacious doubters of the captain's calculations, who, as soon as his back was turned, would, in the absence of compasses, measure the chart with bits of string, and ends of pocket-handkerchiefs, and points of snuffers, and clearly prove him to be wrong by an odd thousand miles or so. It was very edifying to see these unbelievers shake their heads and frown, and hear them hold forth strongly upon navigation, not that they knew anything about it, but that they always mistrusted the captain in calm weather, or when the wind was adverse. Indeed, the mercury itself was not so variable as this class of passengers, whom you will see, when the ship is going nobly through the water, quite pale with aberration, swearing that the captain beats all captains ever known, or even hinting at subscriptions for a piece of plate, and who, next morning, when the breeze has lulled, and all the sails hang useless in the idle air, shake their despondent heads again, and say with screwed-up lips, they hope that captain is a sailor, but they shrewdly doubt him. It even became an occupation in the calm to wonder when the wind would spring up in the favourable quarter, where, it was clearly shown by all the rules and precedents, it ought to have sprung up long ago. The first mate, who whistled for it zealously, was much respected for his perseverance, and was regarded even by the unbelievers as a first-rate sailor. Many gloomy looks would be cast upward through the cabin skylights at the flapping sails while dinner was in progress, and some, growing bold in ruthfulness, predicted that we should land about the middle of July. There are always on board ship a sanguine one and a despondent one. The latter character carried it hollow at this period of the voyage, and triumphed over the sanguine one at every meal, by inquiring whether he supposed the great western, which left New York a week after us, was now and where he supposed the canard steam-packet was now, and what he thought of sailing-vessels as compared with steamships now, and so beset his life with pestilent attacks of that kind, that he too was obliged to affect despondency for very peace and quietude. These were additions to the list of entertaining incidents, but there was still another source of interest. We carried in the steerage nearly a hundred passengers, a little world of poverty, and as we came to know individuals among them by sight from looking down upon the deck where they took the air in the daytime, and cooked their food, and very often ate it too, we became curious to know their histories, and with what expectations they had gone out to America, and on what errands they were going home, and what their circumstances were. The information we got on these heads from the carpenter, who had charge of these people, was often of the strangest kind. Some of them had been in America but three days— 
some but three months, and some had gone out in the last voyage of that very ship in which they were now returning home. Others had sold their clothes to raise the passage money, and had hardly rags to cover them. Others had no food, and lived upon the charity of the rest, and one man, it was discovered nearly at the end of the voyage, not before, for he kept his secret close and did not court compassion, had had no sustenance whatever but the bones and scraps of fat he took from the plates used in the after-cabin dinner when they were put out to be washed. The whole system of shipping and conveying these unfortunate persons is one that stands in need of thorough revision. If any class deserve to be protected and assisted by the government, it is that class who are banished from their native land in search of the bare means of subsistence. All that could be done for these poor people by the great compassion and humanity of the captain and officers was done, but they require much more. The law is bound, at least upon the English side, to see that too many of them are not put on board one ship, and that their accommodations are decent, not demoralizing, and profligate. It is bound, too, in common humanity, to declare that no man shall be taken on board without his stock of provisions being previously inspected by some proper officer, and pronounced moderately sufficient for his support upon the voyage. It is bound to provide, or to require, that there be provided, a medical attendant, whereas in these ships there are none, though sickness of adults and deaths of children on the passage are matters of the very commonest occurrence. Above all, it is the duty of any government, be it monarchy or republic, to interpose and put an end to that system by which a firm of traders in emigrants purchase of the owners the whole tween decks of a ship, and send on board as many wretched people as they can lay hold of, on any terms they can get, without the smallest reference to the conveniences of the steerage, the number of berths, the slightest separation of the sexes, or anything but their own immediate profit." nor is even this the worst of the vicious system for certain crimping agents of these houses who have a percentage on all the passengers they inveigle are constantly travelling about those districts where poverty and discontent are rife and tempting the credulous into more misery by holding out monstrous inducements to emigration which can never be realised the history of every family we had on board was pretty much the same after hoarding up and borrowing and begging and selling everything to pay the passage, they had gone out to New York expecting to find streets paved with gold, and had found them paved with very hard and very real stones. Enterprise was dull, laborers were not wanted, jobs of work were to be got, but the payment was not. They were coming back even poorer than they went. One of them was carrying an open letter from a young English artisan, who had been in New York a fortnight, to a friend near Manchester, whom he strongly urged to follow him. One of the officers brought it to me as a curiosity. "'This is the country, Jim,' said the writer. "'I like America. There is no despotism here. That's the great thing. Employment of all sorts is going a-begging, and wages are capital. You have only to choose a trade, Jim, and be it.' I haven't made a choice of one yet, but I shall soon. At present I haven't quite made up my mind whether to be a carpenter or a tailor. There was yet another kind of passenger, and but one more, who in the calm and light winds was a constant theme of conversation and observation among us. This was an English sailor, a smart, thorough-built English man-o'-war's man from his hat to his shoes, who was serving in the American Navy, and having got leave of absence was on his way home to see his friends. When he presented himself to take and pay for his passage, it had been suggested to him that, being an able seaman, he might as well work it and save the money. But this piece of advice he very indignantly rejected, saying, he'd be damned but for once he'd go aboard ship as a gentleman. Accordingly they took his money, but he no sooner came aboard than he stowed his kit in the forecastle, arranged to mess with the crew, and the very first time the hands were turned up, went aloft like a cat before anybody and all through the passage there he was, first at the braces, outermost on the yard, perpetually lending a hand everywhere, but always with a sober dignity in his manner, and a sober grin on his face, which plainly said, I do it as a gentleman, for my own pleasure, mind you. At length and at last the promised wind came up in right good earnest, and away we went before it, with every stitch of canvas set slashing through the water nobly. There was a grandeur in the motion of the splendid ship, as overshadowed by her massive sails, she rode at a furious pace upon the waves, which filled one with an indescribable sense of pride and exultation. As she plunged into a foaming valley, 
How I love to see the green waves, bordered deep with white, come rushing on astern, to buoy her upward at their pleasure, and curl about her as she stooped again, but always own her for their haughty mistress still. On, on we flew, with changing lights upon the water, being now in the blessed region of fleecy skies, a bright sun lighting us by day, and a bright moon by night the vein pointing directly homeward, alike the truthful index to the favouring wind and to our cheerful hearts, until at sunrise one fair Monday morning, the twenty-seventh of June, I shall not easily forget the day, there lay before us old Cape Clear, God bless it, showing in the mist of early morning like a cloud, the brightest and most welcome cloud to us that ever hid the face of heaven's fallen sister, home. Dim speck as it was in the wide prospect, it made the sunrise a more cheerful sight, and gave to it that sort of human interest which it seems to want at sea. There, as elsewhere, the return of day is inseparable from some sense of renewed hope and gladness, but the light shining on the dreary waste of water and showing it in all its vast extent of loneliness presents a solemn spectacle which even night, veiling it in darkness and uncertainty, does not surpass. The rising of the moon is more in keeping with the solitary ocean, and has an air of melancholy grandeur, which in its soft and gentle influence seems to comfort while it saddens. I recollect when I was a very young child having a fancy that the reflection of the moon in water was a path to heaven trodden by the spirits of good people on their way to God, and this old feeling often came over me again when I watched it on a tranquil night at sea. The wind was very light on this same Monday morning but it was still in the right quarter, and so by slow degrees we left Cape Clear behind, and sailed along within sight of the coast of Ireland, and how merrily we all were, and how loyal to the George Washington, and how full of mutual congratulations, and how venturesome in predicting the exact hour at which we should arrive at Liverpool, may be easily imagined and readily understood." also how heartily we drank the captain's health that day at dinner, and how restless we became about packing up, and how two or three of the most sanguine spirits rejected the idea of going to bed at all that night as something it was not worth while to do, so near the shore, but went nevertheless and slept soundly, and how to be so near our journey's end was like a pleasant dream from which one feared to wake. The friendly breeze freshened again next day, and on we went once more before it gallantly, descrying now and then an English ship going homeward under shortened sail, while we, with every inch of canvas crowded on, dashed gaily past and left her far behind. Towards evening the weather turned hazy, with a drizzling rain, and soon became so thick that we sailed as it were in a cloud. Still we swept onward like a phantom ship, and many an eager eye glanced up to where the lookout on the mast kept watch for Holyhead. At length his long-expected cry was heard, and at the same moment there shone out from the haze and mist ahead a gleaming light, which presently was gone, and soon returned, and soon was gone again. Whenever it came back, the eyes of all on board brightened and sparkled like itself, and there we all stood watching this revolving light upon the rock at Holyhead, and praising it for its brightness and its friendly warning, and lauding it, in short, above all signal lights that ever were displayed, until it once more glimmered faintly in the distance far behind us. Then it was time to fire a gun for a pilot, and almost before its smoke had cleared away, a little boat with a light at her masthead came bearing down upon us, through the darkness, swiftly. And presently, our sails being backed, she ran alongside, and the horse pilot, wrapped and muffled in pea coats and shawls to the very bridge of her weather ploughed up nose, stood bodily among us on the deck. And I think if that pilot had wanted to borrow fifty pounds for an indefinite period on no security, we should have engaged to lend it to him among us before his boat had dropped astern, or, which is the same thing, before every scrap of news in the paper he brought with him had become the common property of all on board. We turned in pretty late that night, and turned out pretty early next morning. By six o'clock we clustered on the deck, prepared to go ashore, and looked upon the spires and roofs and smoke of Liverpool. By eight we all set down in one of its hotels to eat and drink together for the last time, and by nine we had shaken hands all round, and broken up our social company forever. The country, by the railroad, seemed as we rattled through it like a luxuriant garden, the beauty of the fields, so small they looked, the hedgerows and the trees, the pretty cottages, the beds of flowers, the old churchyard, the antique houses, and every well-known object, the exquisite delights of that one journey, 
crowded in the short compass of a summer's day the joy of many years with the winding up with home and all that makes it dear no tongue can tell or pen of mine describe end of chapter sixteen american notes chapter seventeen this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by brad philippone american notes by charles dickens chapter seventeen slavery the upholders of slavery in america of the atrocities of which system i shall not write one word for which i have not had ample proof and warrant may be divided into three great classes the first are those more moderate and rational owners of human cattle who have come into the possession of them as so many coins in their trading capital but who admit the frightful nature of the institution in the abstract and perceive the dangers to society with which it is fraught dangers which however distant they may be or howsoever tardy in their coming on are as certain to fall upon its guilty head as is the day of judgment the second consists of all those owners breeders users buyers and sellers of slaves who will until the bloody chapter has a bloody end own breed use buy and sell them at all hazards who doggedly deny the horrors of the system in the teeth of such a mass of evidence as never was brought to bear on any other subject and to which the experience of every day contributes its immense amount who would at this or any other moment gladly involve america in a war civil or foreign provided that it had for its sole end and object the assertion of their right to perpetuate slavery and to whip and work and torture slaves unquestioned by any human authority and unassailed by any human power who when they speak of freedom mean the freedom to oppress their kind and to be savage merciless and cruel and of whom every man on his own ground in republican america is a most exacting and a sterner and a less responsible despot than the caliph horain arashad in his angry robe of scarlet the third and not the least numerous or influential is composed of all that delicate gentility which cannot bear a superior and cannot brook an equal of that class whose republicanism means i will not tolerate a man above me and of those below none must approach too near whose pride in a land where voluntary servitude is shunned as a disgrace must be ministered to by slaves and whose inalienable rights can only have their growth in negro wrongs it has been sometimes urged in the unavailing efforts which have been made to advance the cause of human freedom in the republic of america strange cause for history to treat of sufficient regard has not been had to the existence of the first class of persons and it has been contended that they are hardly used in being confounded with the second this is no doubt the case noble instances of pecuniary and personal sacrifice have already had their growth among them and it is much to be regretted that the gulf between them and the advocates of emancipation should have been widened and deepened by any means the rather as they are beyond dispute among these slave-owners many kind masters who are tender in the exercise of their unnatural power still it is to be feared that this injustice is inseparable from the state of things with which humanity and truth are called upon to deal slavery is not a whit the more endurable because some hearts are to be found which can partially resist its hardening influences nor can the indignant tide of honest wrath stand still because in its onward course it overwhelms a few who are comparatively innocent among a host of guilty the ground most commonly taken by these better men among the advocates of slavery is this it is a bad system and for myself i would willingly get rid of it if i could most willingly but it is not so bad as you in england take it to be you are deceived by the representations of the emancipationists the greater part of my slaves are much attached to me you will say that i do not allow them to be severely treated but i will put it to you whether you believe that it can be a general practice to treat them inhumanely when it would impair their value and would be obviously against the interests of their masters is it in the interest of any man to steal to game to waste his health and mental faculties by drunkenness to lie forswear himself indulge hatred seek desperate revenge or do murder no all these are roads to ruin and why then do men tread them 
because such inclinations are among the vicious qualities of mankind blot out ye friends of slavery from the catalogue of human passions brutal lust cruelty and the abuse of irresponsible power of all earthly temptations the most difficult to be resisted and when ye have done so and not before we will inquire whether it be in the interest of a master to lash and maim the slaves over whose lives and limbs he has an absolute control but again this class together with that last one i have named the miserable aristocracy spawned of a false republic lift up their voices and exclaim public opinion is all sufficient to prevent such cruelty as you denounce public opinion why public opinion in the slave states is slavery is it not public opinion in the slave states has delivered the slaves over to the gentle mercies of their masters public opinion has made the laws and denied the slaves legislative protection public opinion has knotted the lash heated the branding iron loaded the rifle and shielded the murderer public opinion threatens the abolitionist with death if he venture to the south and drags him with a rope about his middle in broad unblushing noon through the first city in the east public opinion has within a few years burned a slave alive at a slow fire in the city of st louis and public opinion has to this day maintained upon the bench that estimable judge who charged the jury impanelled them to try his murderers that the most horrid deeds was an act of public opinion and being so must not be punished by the laws the public sentiment has made public opinion hailed this doctrine with a howl of wild applause and set the prisoners free to walk the city men of mark and influence and station as they had been before public opinion what class of men have an immense preponderance over the rest of the community in their power of representing public opinion in the legislature the slave owners they send from their twelve states one hundred members while the fourteen free states, with a free population nearly double, return but a hundred and forty-two. Before whom do the presidential candidates bow down the most humbly, on whom do they fawn the most fondly, and for whose taste do they cater the most assiduously in their servile protestations? The slave-owners always. Public Opinion here the public opinion of the free South is expressed by its own members in the House of Representatives at Washington. I have a great respect for the chair, quoth North Carolina. I have a great respect for the chair as an officer of the House, and a great respect for him personally. Nothing but that respect prevents me from rushing to the table and tearing that petition which has just been prevented for the abolition of slavery in the District of Columbia to pieces. I warn the abolitionists, says South Carolina, ignorant, infuriated barbarians as they are, that if chance shall throw any of them into our hands, he may expect a felon's death. Let an abolitionist come within the borders of South Carolina, cries a third, mild Carolina's colleague, and if we can catch him, we will try him, and notwithstanding the interference of all the governments on earth, including the federal government, we will hang him. Public opinion has made this law. It has declared that in Washington, in that city which takes its name from the father of American liberty, any justice of the peace may bind with fetters any negro passing down the streets and thrust him into jail no offence on the black man's part is necessary the justice says i choose to think this man a runaway and locks him up public opinion empowers the man of law when this is done to advertise the negro in the newspapers warning his owner to come and claim him or he will be sold to pay the jail fees but supposing he is a free black and has no owner it may naturally be presumed that he is set at liberty no he is sold to recompense his jailer this has been done again and again and again he has no means of proving his freedom has no adviser messenger or assistance of any sort or kind no investigation into his case is made or inquiry instituted he a free man who may have served for years and bought his liberty is thrown into jail on no process for no crime and on no pretense of crime and is sold to pay the jail fees this seems incredible even of america but it is the law public opinion is deferred to in such cases as the following which is headed in the newspapers interesting law case an interesting case is now on trial in the supreme court arising out of the following facts a gentleman residing in maryland has allowed an aged pair of his slaves substantial though not legal freedom for several years while thus living a daughter was born to them who grew up in the same liberty until she married a free negro and went with him to reside in pennsylvania they had several children and lived unmolested until the original owner died when his heir attempted to regain them 
but the magistrate before whom they were brought decided that he had no jurisdiction in the case. The owner seized the women and her children in the night and carried them to Maryland. Cash for Negroes, cash for Negroes, cash for Negroes is the heading of advertisements in great capitals down the long columns of the crowded journals. Woodcuts of a runaway Negro with manacled hands crouching beneath a bluff pursuer in top boots, who having caught him grasped him by the throat, agreeably diversify the pleasant text. The leading article protests against that abominable and hellish doctrine of abolition, which is repugnant alike to every law of God and nature. The delicate mamma, who smiles her acquiescence in this sprightly writing as she reads the paper in her cool piazza, quiets her youngest child, who clings about her skirts, by promising the boy a whip to beat the little niggers with. But the negroes, little and big, are protected by public opinion. Let us try the public opinion by another test, which is important in three points of view. First, as showing how desperately timid of the public opinion slave owners are in their delicate descriptions of fugitive slaves in widely circulated newspapers. Secondly, as showing how perfectly contented the slaves are, and how very seldom they run away. Thirdly, as exhibiting their entire freedom from scar or blemish or any mark of cruel infliction as their pictures are drawn not by lying abolitionists, but by their own truthful masters. The following are a few specimens of the advertisements in the public papers. It is only four years since the oldest among them appeared, and others of the same nature continue to be published every day in shoals. Ran away. Negress Caroline. Head on a collar with one prong turned down. Ran away. A black woman. Betsy. Had an iron bar on her right leg. Ran away. The Negro Manuel. Much marked with irons. Ran away. The Negress Fanny. Had on an iron band about her neck. Ran away, a negro boy about twelve years old, had round his neck a chain dog collar with de Lampart engraved on it. Ran away, the negro hound, has a ring of iron on his left foot, also grease his wife, leaving a ring and chain on the left leg. Ran away, a negro boy named James, said boy was ironed when he left me. Committed to jail, a man who calls his name John. He has a clog of iron on his right foot which will weigh four or five pounds. Detained at the police jail, the negro wench Myra has several marks of lashing and has irons on her feet. Ran away, a negro woman and two children. A few days before she went off, I burnt her with a hot iron on the left side of her face. I tried to make the letter M. Ran away, a negro man named Henry, his left eye out some scars from a dirk on and under his left arm, and much scarred with the whip. One hundred dollars reward for a negro fellow, Pompey, forty years old. He is branded on the left jaw. Committed to jail, a negro man, has no toes on the left foot. Ran away, a negro woman named Rachel, has lost all her toes except the large one. Ran away, Sam. He was shot a short time since through the hand, and has several shots in his left arm and side. Ran away, my negro man, Dennis. Said negro has been shot in the left arm between the shoulder and elbow, which has paralyzed the left hand. Ran away, my negro man named Simon. He has been shot badly in his back and right arm. Ran away, a negro named Arthur. Has a considerable scar across his breast and each arm, made by a knife, loves to talk much of the goodness of God. Twenty-five dollars reward for my man Isaac. He has a scar on his forehead caused by a blow, and one on his back made by a shot from a pistol. Run away, a negro girl called Mary. Has a small scar over her eye, a good many teeth missing. The letter A is branded on her cheek and forehead. Ran away, negro Ben. Has a scar on his right hand, his thumb and forefinger being injured by being shot last fall. A part of the bone came out. He has also one or two large scars on his back and hips. Detained at the jail, a mulatto named Tom. Has a scar on the right cheek and appears to have been burned with powder on the face. Ran away a negro man named Ned. Three of his fingers are drawn into the palm of his hand by a cut. Has a scar on the back of his neck, nearly half round, done by a knife. Was committed to jail a negro man. Says his name is Josiah. His back very much scarred by the whip, and branded on the thigh and hips in three or four places, thus J.M. 
the rim of his right ear has been bit or cut off. Fifty dollars reward for my fellow Edward. He has a scar on the corner of his mouth, two cuts on and under his arm, and the letter E on his arm. Ran away, Negro boy Ellie. Has a scar on one of his arms from the bite of a dog. Ran away from the plantation of James Surgit, the following Negroes. Randall has one ear cropped, Bob has lost one eye, Kentucky Tom has one jaw broken. Ran away, Anthony, one of his ears cut off, and his left hand cut with an axe. Fifty dollars reward for the Negro Jim Blake. Has a piece cut out of each ear, and the middle finger of the left hand cut off to the second joint. Ran away a Negro woman named Maria. Has a scar on one side of her cheek by a cut, some scars on her back. Ran away the mulatto wench Mary. Has a cut on the left arm, a scar on the left shoulder, and two upper teeth missing. I should say, perhaps, an explanation of this latter piece of description, that among the other blessings which public opinion secures to the negroes is the common practice of violently punching out their teeth, to make them wear iron collars by day and night, and to worry them with dogs are practices almost too ordinary to deserve mention. Ran away, my man Fountain, has holes in his ears, a scar on the right side of his forehead, has been shot in the hind part of his legs, and is marked on the back with the whip. Two hundred and fifty dollars reward for my negro man Jim. He is much marked with shot in his right thigh. The shot entered on the outside, halfway between the hip and knee joints. Brought to jail, John, left ear cropped. Taken up, a negro man. Is very much scarred about the face and body, and has the left ear bit off. Ran away, a black girl named Mary. Has a scar on her cheek, and the end of one of her toes cut off. Ran away my mulatto woman, Judy. She has had her right arm broke. Ran away my negro man, Levi. His left hand has been burnt, and I think the end of his forefinger is off. Ran away a negro man named Washington. Has lost a part of his middle finger, and the end of his little finger. Twenty-five dollars reward for my man, John. The tip of his nose is bit off. Twenty-five dollars reward for the negro slave, Sally, Walks as though crippled in the back. Ran away, Joe Dennis. Has a small notch in one of his ears. Ran away, Negro boy, Jack. Has a small crop out of his left ear. Ran away, a Negro man named Ivory. Has a small piece cut out of the top of each ear. Well upon the subject of ears, I may observe that a distinguished abolitionist in New York once received a Negro's ear, which had been cut off close to the head, in a general post letter. It was forwarded by the free and independent gentleman who had caused it to be amputated, with a polite request that he would place the specimen in his collection. I could enlarge this catalogue with broken arms and broken legs and gnashed flesh and missing teeth and lacerated backs and bites of dogs and brands of red-hot irons innumerable, but as my readers will be sufficiently sickened and repelled already, I will turn to another branch of the subject. These advertisements, of which a similar collection may be made for every year and month and week and day, and which are coolly read in families as things of course, and as a part of the current news and small talk, will serve to show how very much the slaves profit by public opinion, and how tender it is in their behalf. But it may be worth while to inquire how the slave-owners, and the class of society to which great numbers of them belong, defer to public opinion in their conduct, not to their slaves, but to each other, how they are accustomed to restrain their passions, what their bearing is among themselves, whether they are fierce or gentle, whether their social customs be brutal, sanguinary, and violent, or bear the impress of civilization and refinement. That we may have no partial evidence from abolitionists in this inquiry either, I will once more turn to their own newspapers, and I will confine myself this time to a selection from paragraphs which appeared from day to day during my visit to America, and which refer to occurrences happening while I was there. The italics in these extracts, as in the foregoing, are my own. These cases did not all occur, it will be seen, in territory actually belonging to legalized slave states, though most, and those of the very worst among them, did, as their counterparts constantly do. 
but the position of the scenes of action in reference to places immediately at hand where slavery is the law and the strong resemblance between that class of outrages and the rest lead to the just presumption that the character of the parties concerned was formed in slave districts and brutalized by slave customs horrible tragedy by a ship from the southport telegraph wisconsin we learn that the hon charles c p arnold member of the council for brown county was shot dead on the floor of the council chamber by james r vineyard member from grant county the affair grew out of a nomination for sheriff of grant county mr e s baker was nominated and supported by mr arndt the nomination was opposed by vineyard who wanted the appointment to vest in his own brother in the course of debate the deceased made some statements which vineyard pronounced false and made use of violent and insulting language dealing largely in personalities to which mr a made no reply after the adjournment mr a stepped up to vineyard and requested him to retract which he refused to do repeating the offensive words mr arndt then made a blow at vineyard who stepped back a pace drew a pistol and shot him dead the issue appears to have been provoked on the part by vineyard who was determined at all hazards to defeat the appointment of baker and who himself defeated turned his ire and revenge upon the unfortunate arndt the wisconsin tragedy public indignation runs high in the territory of wisconsin in relation to the murder of c c p arndt in the legislative hall of the territory meetings have been held in different counties in washington denouncing the practice of secretly bearing arms in the legislative chambers of the country we have seen the account of the expulsion of james r vineyard the perpetrator of the bloody deed and are amazed to hear that after this expulsion by those who saw vineyard kill mr arndt in the presence of his aged father who was on a visit to see his son little dreaming that he was to witness his murder judge dunn has discharged vineyard on bail the miners free press speaks in terms of merited rebuke at the outrage upon the feelings of the people of wisconsin vineyard was within arm's length of mr arndt when he took such deadly aim at him that he never spoke vineyard might at pleasure being so near have only wounded him but he chose to kill him murder by a letter in a st louis paper of the fourth we notice a terrible outrage at burlington iowa a mr bridgman having had a difficulty with a citizen of the place mr ross a brother-in-law of the latter provided himself with one of colt's revolving pistols met mr b in the street and discharged the contents of five of the barrels at him each shot taking effect mr b though horribly wounded and dying returned the fire and killed ross on the spot terrible death of robert potter from the caddo gazette of the twelfth instant we learn of the frightful death of colonel robert potter he was beset in his house by an enemy named rose he sprang from his coach seized his gun in his night-clothes rushed from the house for about two hundred yards his speed seemed to defy his pursuers but getting entangled in a thicket he was captured rose told him that he intended to act a generous part and give him a chance for his life he then told potter he might run and should not be interrupted till he reached a certain distance potter started at the word of command and before a gun was fired he had reached the lake his first impulse was to jump into the water and dive for it which he did rose was close behind him and formed his men on the bank ready to shoot him as he rose in a few seconds he came up to breathe and scarce had his head reached the surface of the water when it was completely riddled with a shot of their guns and he sunk to rise no more murder in arkansas we understand that a severe rencontre came off a few days since in the seneca nation between mr luce the sub-agent of the mixed band of the senecas quapaw and the shawnees and mr james gillespie of the mercantile firm of thomas g allenson and company of maysville benton county arkansas in which the latter was slain with a bowie knife some difficulty had for some time existed between the parties it is said that major gillespie brought on the attack with a cane a severe conflict ensued during which two pistols were fired by gillespie and one by luce luce then stabbed gillespie with one of those never failing weapons a bowie knife the death of major g is much regretted as he was a liberal-minded and energetic man since the above was in type we have learned that major allison has stated to some of our citizens in town that mr luce gave the first blow we forbear to give any particulars as the matter will be the subject of judicial investigation foul deed the steamer thames just from missouri river 
brought us a handbill offering a reward of five hundred dollars for the person who assassinated Lilburn W. Baggs, late governor of this state, at Independence, on the night of the sixth instant. Governor Baggs, it is stated, in written memorandum, was not dead, but mortally wounded. Since the above was written, we received a note from the clerk of the Thames giving the following particulars. Governor Beggs was shot by some villain on Friday, sixth instant, in the evening, while sitting in a room in his own house in Independence. His son, a boy, hearing a report, ran into the room and found the governor sitting in his chair with his jaw fallen down and his head leaning back. On discovering the injury done to his father, he gave the alarm. Foot tracks were found in the garden below the window, and a pistol picked up supposed to have been overloaded and thrown from the hand of the scoundrel who fired it. Three buckshots of a heavy load took effect, one going through his mouth, one into the brain, and another probably in or near the brain, all going to the back part of the neck and head. The governor was still alive on the morning of the 7th, but no hopes for his recovery by his friends, and but slight hopes for his physicians. A man was suspected, and the sheriff most probably has possession of him by this time. The pistol was one of a pair stolen some days previous from a baker in Independence, and the legal authorities have the description of the other. Recontra An unfortunate affair took place on Friday evening in Chatras Street, in which one of our most respectable citizens received a dangerous wound from a poignard in the abdomen. From the B. New Orleans of yesterday, we learn the following particulars. It appears that an article was published in the French side of the paper on Monday last, containing some strictures on the artillery battalion for firing their guns on Sunday morning, in answer to those for the Ontario and Woodbury, and thereby much alarm was caused to the families of those persons who were out all night preserving the peace of the city. Major C. Galley, commander of the battalion, resenting this, called at the office and demanded the author's name, that of Mr. P. Arpin, was given to him, who was absent at the time. Some angry words then passed with one of the proprietors, and a challenge followed. The friends of both parties tried to arrange the affair, but failed to do so. On Friday evening, about seven o'clock, Major Galley met Mr. P. Arpin in Chatteris Street and accosted him. "'Are you Mr. Arpin?' "'Yes, sir.' "'Then I have to tell you that you are a—' applying an appropriate epithet. "'I shall remind you of your words, sir. But I have said I would break my cane on your shoulders. I know it, but I have not yet received the blow. At these words, Major Galley, having a cane in his hands, struck Mr. Arpin across the face, and the latter drew a poniard from his pocket and stabbed Major Galley in the abdomen. Fears are entertained that the wound will be mortal. We understand that Mr. Arpin has given security for his appearance at the criminal court to answer the charge. A Fray in Mississippi on the twenty seventh, in an affray near Carthage, Leake County, Mississippi, between James Cottingham and John Wilburn, the latter was shot by the former and so horribly wounded that there was no hope of his recovery. On the second instant, there was an affray at Carthage between A. C. Sharkey and George Goff, in which the latter was shot and thought mortally wounded. Sharkey delivered himself up to the authorities, but changed his mind and escaped. Personal Encounter an encounter took place in Sparta a few days since between the barkeeper of an hotel and a man named Bury. It appears that Bury had become somewhat noisy and that the barkeeper, determined to preserve order, had threatened to shoot Bury, whereupon Bury drew a pistol and shot the barkeeper down. He was not dead at the last accounts, but slight hopes were entertained of his recovery. Duel the clerk of the steamboat tribune informs us that another duel was fought on tuesday last by mr robbins a bank officer in vicksburg and mr fall the editor of the vicksburg sentinel according to the arrangement the parties had six pistols each which after the word fire they were to discharge as fast as they pleased fall fired two pistols without effect mr robbins first shot took effect in fall's thigh who fell and was unable to continue the combat Affray in Clark County. An unfortunate affray occurred in Clark County, Missouri, near Waterloo, on Tuesday, the 19th ultimate, which originated in settling the partnership concerns of Messrs. McCain and McAllister, who had been engaged in the business of distilling and resulting in the death of the latter, who was shot down by Mr. McCain because of his attempts to take possession of seven barrels of whiskey, the property of McCain, which had been knocked off to McAllister at a sheriff's sale at one dollar per barrel. 
McCain immediately fled, and at the latest dates have not been taken. This unfortunate affray caused considerable excitement in the neighbourhood, as both the parties were men with large families depending on them and stood well in the community. I will quote but one more paragraph, which by reason of its monstrous absurdity may be a relief to these atrocious deeds. Affair of Honour we have just heard the particulars of a meeting which took place on Six Mile Island on Tuesday between two young bloods of our city, Samuel Thurston, aged fifteen, and William Hine, aged thirteen years. They were attended by young gentlemen of the same age. The weapons used on the occasion were a couple of Dixon's best rifles, the distance thirty yards. They took one fire without any damage being sustained by either party, except the ball of Thurston's gun passing through the crown of Hines' hat. Through the intercession of the Board of Honour, the challenge was withdrawn, and the difference amicably adjusted. If the reader will picture to himself the kind of Board of Honour which amicably adjusted the difference between these two little boys, who in any other part of the world would have been amicably adjusted on two porter's backs and soundly flogged with birchen rods, he will be possessed, no doubt, with as strong a sense of its ludicrous character as that which sets me laughing whenever its image rises up before me. Now I appeal to every human mind, imbued with the commonest of common sense, and the commonest of common humanity, to all dispassionate reasoning creatures of any shade of opinion, and ask with these revolting evidences of the state of society which exists in and about the slave districts of America before them, can they have a doubt of the real condition of the slave, or can they for a moment make a compromise between the institution or any of its flagrant, fearful features, and their own just consciences? Will they say, of any tale of cruelty and horror, however aggravated in detail, that it is improbable, when they can turn to the public prints and running, read such signs as these laid before them by the men who rule the slaves, in their own acts and under their own hands? Do we not know that the worst deformity and ugliness of slavery are at once the cause and the effect of the reckless license taken by these freeborn outlaws? do we not know that the man who has been born and bred among its wrongs who has seen in his childhood husbands obliged at the word of command to flog their wives women indecently compelled to hold up their own garments that men may lay the heavier stripes upon their legs driven and harried by brutal overseers in their time of travail and becoming mothers on the field of toil under the very lash itself who has read in youth, and seen his virgin sisters read, descriptions of runaway men and women and their disfigured persons, which could not be published elsewhere, of so much stock upon a farm or at a show of beasts. Do we not know that that man, whenever his wrath is kindled up, will be a brutal savage? Do we not know that as he is a coward in his domestic life, stalking among his shrinking men and women slaves, armed with his heavy whip, so he will be a coward out of doors, and carrying coward's weapons hidden in his breast, will shoot men down and stab them when he quarrels? And if our reason did not teach us this and much beyond, if we were such idiots as to close our eyes to that fine mode of training which rears up such men, should we not know that they who among their equals stab and pistol in the legislative halls, and in the counting-house, and on the market-place, and in all the elsewhere peaceful pursuits of life, must be to their dependents, even though they were free servants, so many merciless and unrelenting tyrants? What, shall we declaim against the ignorant peasantry of Ireland, and mince the matter when these American taskmasters are in question? Shall we cry shame on the brutality of those who hamstring cattle, and spare the lights of freedom upon earth, who notch the ears of men and women, cut pleasant posies and the shrinking flesh, learn to write with pens of red-hot iron on the human face, rack their poetic fancies for liveries of mutilation which their slaves shall wear for life, and carry to the grave, breaking living limbs as did the soldiery who mocked and slew the saviour of the world, and set defenceless creatures up for targets? 
shall we whimper over legends of the tortures practised on each other by the pagan indians and smile upon the cruelties of christian men shall we so long as these things last exult above the scattered remnants of that race and triumph in the white enjoyment of their possessions rather for me restore the forest and the indian village in lieu of stars and stripes let some poor feather flutter in the breeze replace the streets and squares by wigwams and though the death-song of a hundred haughty warriors fill the air it will be music to the shriek of one unhappy slave on one theme which is commonly before our eyes and in respect of which our national character is changing fast let the plain truth be spoken, and let us not, like dastards, beat about the bush by hinting at the Spaniard and the fierce Italian. When knives are drawn by Englishmen in conflict, let it be said and known, we owe this change to Republican slavery. These are the weapons of freedom. With sharp points and edges such as these, liberty in America hews and hacks her slave, or, failing that pursuit, her sons devote them to a better use and turn them on each other. End of chapter 17《American Notes》Chapter 18 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Brad Philippone. American Notes by Charles Dickens Chapter 18 Concluding Remarks and Postscript there are many passages in this book where I have been at some pains to resist the temptation of troubling my readers with my own deductions and conclusions, preferring that they should judge for themselves from such premises as I have laid before them. My only object in the outset was to carry them with me faithfully wheresoever I went, and that task I have discharged. But I may be pardoned if on such a theme as the general character of the American people, and the general character of their social system as presented to a stranger's eyes, I desire to express my own opinions in a few words before I bring these volumes to a close. They are, by nature, frank, brave, cordial, hospitable, and affectionate. Cultivation and refinement seem but to enhance their warmth of heart and ardent enthusiasm, and it is the possession of these latter qualities in a most remarkable degree which renders an educated American one of the most endearing and most generous of friends. I never was so won upon as by this class, never yielded up my full confidence and esteem so readily and pleasurably as to them, never can make again in half a year so many friends for whom I seem to entertain the regard of half a life. These qualities are natural, I implicitly believe, to the whole people. That they are, however, sadly sapped and blighted in their growth among the mass, and that there are influences at work which endanger them still more, and give but little present promise of their healthy restoration, is a truth that ought to be told. It is an essential part of every national character to pique itself mightily upon its faults, and to deduce tokens of its virtue or its wisdom from their very exaggeration. One great blemish in the popular mind of America, and the prolific parent of an innumerable brood of evils, is universal distrust. Yet the American citizen plumes himself upon this spirit, even when he is sufficiently dispassionate to perceive the ruin it works, and will often adduce it, in spite of his own reason, as an instance of the great sagacity and acuteness of the people, and their superior shrewdness and independence. "'You carry,' says the stranger, "'this jealousy and distrust into every transaction of public life. By repelling worthy men from your legislative assemblies, it has bred up a class of candidates for the suffrage, who, in their very act, disgrace your institutions and your people's choice. It has rendered you so fickle and so given to change that your inconstantly has passed into a proverb, for you no sooner set up an idol firmly than you are sure to pull it down and dash it into fragments, and this because directly you reward a benefactor or a public servant, you distrust him merely because he is rewarded, and immediately apply yourself to find out either that you have been too bountiful in your acknowledgments, or he remiss in his deserts. Any man who attains a high place among you, from the President downwards, may date his downfall from that moment, for any printed lie that any notorious villain pens, although it militate directly against the character and conduct of a life, appeals at once to your distrust and is believed. 
you will strain at a gnat in the way of trustfulness and confidence, however fairly won and well deserved. But you will swallow a whole caravan of camels, if they be laden with unworthy doubts and mean suspicions. Is this well, think you, or likely to elevate the character of the governors or the governed among you? The answer is invariably the same. There's freedom of opinion here, you know. Every man thinks for himself, and we are not to be easily overreached. That's how our people come to be suspicious. Another prominent feature is the love of smart dealing, which gilds over many a swindle and gross breach of trust, many a defalcation, public and private, and enables many a knave to hold his head up with the best, who well deserves a halter, though it has not been without its retributive operation, for this smartness has done more in a few years to impair the public credit, and to cripple the public resources, than dull honesty, however rash, could have effected in a century. The merits of a broken speculation, or a bankruptcy, or of a successful scoundrel, are not gauged by its or his observance of the golden rule, do as you would be done by, but are considered with reference to their smartness. I recollect on both occasions of our passing that ill-fated Cairo on the Mississippi, remarking on the bad effects such gross deceits must have when they exploded, in generating a want of confidence abroad, and discouraging foreign investment. But I was given to understand that this was a very smart scheme by which a deal of money had been made, and that its smartest feature was— that they forgot these things abroad in a very short time, and speculated again as freely as ever. The following dialogue I have held a hundred times. Is it not a very disgraceful circumstance that such a man as so-and-so should be acquiring a large property by the most infamous and odious means, and notwithstanding all the crimes of which he has been guilty, should be tolerated and abetted by your citizens? He is a proper nuisance, is he not? Yes, sir. A convicted liar? Yes, sir. He has been kicked and cuffed and caned, yes, sir. And he is utterly dishonourable, debased, and profligate, yes, sir. In the name of wonder, then, what is his merit? Well, sir, he is a smart man. In like manner, all kinds of deficient and impolitic usages are referred to the national love of trade, though oddly enough it would be a weighty charge against a foreigner that he regarded the Americans as a trading people. The love of trade is assigned as a reason for that comfortless custom, so very prevalent in country towns, of married persons living in hotels, having no fireside of their own, and seldom meeting from early morning until late at night, but at the hasty public meals. The love of trade is a reason why the literature in America is to remain for ever unprotected, for we are a trading people and don't care for poetry though we do, by the way, profess to be very proud of our poets, while healthful amusements, cheerful means of recreation, and wholesome fancies must fade before the stern utilitarian joys of trade. These three characteristics are strongly presented at every turn full in the stranger's view. But the foul growth of America has a more tangled root than this, and it strikes its fibres deep in the licentious press. Schools may be erected, east, west, north, and south, pupils be taught and masters reared by scores upon scores of thousands. Colleges may thrive, churches may be crammed, temperance may be diffused, and advancing knowledge in all other forms walk through the land with great strides. But while the newspaper press of America is in or near its present abject state, high moral improvement in that country is hopeless. Year by year it must and will go back, Year by year the tone of public feeling must sink lower down. Year by year the Congress and the Senate must become of less account before all decent men, and year by year the memory of the great fathers of the Revolution must be outraged more and more in the bad life of their degenerate child. Among herd of journals which are published in the States, there are some, the reader scarcely need be told, of character and credit. From personal intercourse with accomplished gentlemen connected with publications of this class, I have derived both pleasure and profit. But the name of these is few, and of the others legion, and the influence of the good is powerless to counteract the moral poison of the bad. Among the gentry of America, among the well-informed and moderate, in the learned professions, at the bar, and on the bench, there is, as there can be, but one opinion in reference to the vicious character of these infamous journals. 
It is sometimes contended, I will not say strangely, for it is natural to seek excuses for such a disgrace, that their influence is not so great as a visitor would suppose. I must be pardoned for saying that there is no warrant for this plea, and that every fact and circumstance tends directly to the opposite conclusion. When any man of any grade of desert in intellect or character can climb to any public distinction, no matter what, in America, without first grovelling down upon the earth and bending the knee before this monster of depravity, when any private excellence is safe from its attacks, when any social confidence is left unbroken by it, or any tie of social decency and honour is held in the least regard, when any man in that free country has freedom of opinion, and presumes to think for himself and speak for himself without humble reference to a censorship which, for its rampant ignorance and base dishonesty, he utterly loathes and despises in his heart, when those who most acutely feel its infamy and the reproach it casts upon the nation, and who most denounce it to each other, dare to set their heels upon and crush it openly in the sight of all men, then I will believe that its influence is lessening, and men are returning to their manly senses. But while that press has its evil eye in every house, and its black hand in every appointment in the state, from a president to a postman, while with ribald slander for its only stock and trade, it is the standard literature of an enormous class who must find their reading in a newspaper or they will not read at all, so long must its odium be upon the country's head, and so long must the evil it works be plainly visible in the Republic. To those who are accustomed to the leading English journals, or to the respectable journals of the continent of Europe, to those who are accustomed to anything else in print and paper, it would be impossible, without an amount of extract for which I have neither space nor inclination, to convey an adequate idea of this frightful engine in America. But if any man desire confirmation of my statement on this head, let him repair to any place in the City of London where scattered numbers of these publications are to be found, and there let him form his own opinion. Note to the original edition, or let him refer to an able and perfectly truthful article in the Foreign Quarterly Review, published in the present month of October, to which my attention has been attracted since these sheets have been passing through the press. He will find some specimens there by no means remarkable to any man who has been in America, but sufficiently striking to one who has not. It would be well, there can be no doubt, for the American people as a whole, if they love the real less and the ideal somewhat more, it would be well if there were greater encouragement to lightness of heart and gaiety, and a wider cultivation of what is beautiful without being eminently and directly useful. But here I think the general remonstrance, we are a new country, which is so often advanced as an excuse for defects which are quite unjustifiable, as being of right only the slow growth of an old one, may be very reasonably urged. And I yet hope to hear of there being some other national amusement in the United States besides newspaper politics. They certainly are not a humorous people, and their temperament always impressed me as being of a dull and gloomy nature. In shrewdness of remark and a certain cast-iron quaintness, the Yankees, or people of New England, unquestionably take the lead, as they do in most other evidences of intelligence. But in travelling about out of the large cities, as I have remarked in former parts of these volumes, I was quite oppressed by the prevailing seriousness and melancholy air of business, which was so general and unvarying that at every new town I came to, I seemed to meet the very same people whom I had left behind me at the last. Such defects as are perceptible in the national matters seem to me to be referable in a great degree to this cause, which has generated a dull, sullen persistence in coarse usages, and rejected the graces of life as undeserving of attention. There is no doubt that Washington, who was always most scrupulous and exact on points of ceremony, perceived the tendency towards this mistake even in his time, and did his utmost to correct it. I cannot hold with other writers on these subjects that the prevalence of various forms of dissent in America is in any way attributable to the non-existence there of an established church. Indeed, I think the temper of the people, if it admitted to such an institution being founded amongst them, would lead them to desert it as a matter of course, merely because it was established. But supposing it to exist, I doubt its probable efficacy in summoning the wandering sheep to one great fold, simply because of the immense amount of dissent which prevails at home, 
and because I do not find in America any one form of religion with which we in Europe, or even England, are unacquainted. Dissenters resort thither in great numbers, as other people do, simply because it is a land of resort, and great settlements of them are founded, because ground can be purchased, and towns and villages reared, where there were none of the human creation before. But even the Shakers emigrated from England. Our country is not unknown to Mr. Joseph Smith, the Apostle of Mormonism, or to his benighted disciples. I have beheld religious scenes myself in some of our populous towns, which can hardly be surpassed by an American camp-meeting, and I am not aware that any instance of superstitious imposture on the one hand, and superstitious credulity on the other, has had its origin in the United States, which we cannot more than parallel by the precedents of Mrs. Southcote, Mary Toffs the rabbit-breeder, or even Mr. Thorne of Canterbury, which latter case arose some time after the Dark Ages had passed away. The Republican institutions of America undoubtedly lead the people to assert their self-respect and their equality, but a traveller is bound to bear those institutions in his mind, and not hastily to resent the near approach of a class of strangers who, at home, would keep aloof. This characteristic, when it was tinctured with no foolish pride, and stopped short of no honest service, never offended me, and I very seldom, if ever, experienced its rude or unbecoming display. Once or twice it was comically developed, as in the following case, but this was an amusing incident and not the rule, or near it. I wanted a pair of boots at a certain town, for I had none to travel in, but those with the memorable cork soles which were much too hot for the fiery decks of a steamboat. I therefore sent a message to an artist in boots, importing with my compliments that I should be happy to see him if he would do me the polite favour to call. He very kindly returned for answer that he would look round at six o'clock that evening. I was lying on the sofa, with a book and a wine-glass, at about that time when the door opened, and a gentleman in a stiff cravat, within a year or two on either side of thirty, entered in his hat and gloves, walked up to the looking-glass, arranged his hair, took off his gloves, slowly produced measure from the uttermost depths of his coat-pocket, and requested me in a languid tone to unfix my straps. I complied, but looked with some curiosity at his hat, which was still upon his head. It might have been that, or it might have been the heat, but he took it off. Then he sat himself down on a chair opposite to me, rested an arm on each knee, and leaning forward very much, took from the ground by a great effort the specimen of metropolitan workmanship which I had just pulled off, whistling pleasantly as he did so, he turned it over and over, surveyed it with a contempt no language can express, and inquired if I wished him to fix me a boot like that. I courteously replied that provided the boots were large enough, I would leave the rest to him, that if convenient and practicable, I should not object to their bearing some resemblance to the model then before him, but that I would be entirely guided by, and would beg to leave the whole subject to his judgment and discretion. "'You ain't particular about this scoop in the heel, I suppose, then,' says he. "'We don't follow that here.' I repeated my last observation. He looked at himself in the glass again, went closer to it to dash a grain or two of dust out of the corner of his eye, and settled his cravat. All this time my leg and foot were in the air. "'Nearly ready, sir?' I inquired. "'Well, pretty nigh,' he said. "'Keep steady.' I kept as steady as I could, both in foot and face, and having by this time got the dust out, and found his pencil-case, he measured me, and made the necessary notes. When he had finished, he fell into his old attitude, and taking up the boot again, mused for some time. And this, he said at last, is an English boot, is it? This is a London boot, eh? That, sir, I replied, is a London boot. He mused over it again, after the manner of Hamlet with Yorick's skull, nodded his head, as who should say, I pity the institutions that led to the production of this boot, rose, put up his pencil, notes, and paper, glancing at himself in the glass all the time, put on his hat, drew on his gloves very slowly, and finally walked out. When he had been gone about a minute, the door reopened, and his hat and his head reappeared. He looked round the room, and at the boot again, which was still lying on the floor, appeared thoughtful for a minute, and then said, "'Well, good afternoon.' "'Good afternoon, sir,' I said, and that was the end of the interview. There is but one other head on which I wish to offer a remark, and that has reference to the public health. 
in so vast a country where there are thousands of millions of acres of land yet unsettled and uncleared and on every rood of which vegetable decomposition is annually taking place where there are so many great rivers and such opposite varieties of climate there cannot fail to be a great amount of sickness at certain seasons but i may venture to say after conversing with many members of the medical profession in america that i am not singular in the opinion that much of the disease which does prevail might be avoided if a few common precautions were observed greater means of personal cleanliness are indispensable to this end the custom of hastily swallowing large quantities of animal food three times a day and rushing back to sedentary pursuits after every meal must be changed the gentler sex must go more wisely clad and take more healthful exercise and in the latter clause the males must be included also above all in public institutions and throughout the whole of every town and city the system of ventilation and drainage and removal of impurities requires to be thoroughly revised there is no local legislature in America which may not study Mr. Chadwick's excellent retort upon the sanitary condition of our labouring classes with immense advantage. I have now arrived at the close of this book. I have little reason to believe from certain warnings I have had since I returned to England that it will be tenderly or favourably received by the American people, and as I have written in truth in relation to the mass of those who form their judgment and express their opinions it will be seen that i have no desire to court by any adventitious means the popular applause it is enough for me to know that what i have set down in these pages cannot cost me a single friend on the other side of the atlantic who is in anything deserving of the name for the rest i put my trust implicitly in the spirit in which they have been conceived and penned and i can bide my time I have made no reference to my reception, nor have I suffered it to influence me in what I have written, for, in either case, I should have offered but a sorry acknowledgment, compared with that I bear within my breast, towards those partial readers of my former books across the water, who met me with an open hand, and not with one that closed upon an iron muzzle. Postscript at a public dinner given to me on Saturday, the 18th of April, 1868, in the city of New York, by two hundred representatives of the press of the United States of America, I made the following observations, among others. So much of my voice has lately been heard in the land, that I might have been contented with troubling you no further from my present standing-point, were it not a duty with which I henceforth charge myself, not only here, but on every suitable occasion, whatsoever and wheresoever, to express my high and grateful sense of my second reception in America, and to bear my honest testimony to the national generosity and magnanimity. Also to declare how astounded I have been by the amazing changes I have seen around me on every side, changes moral, changes physical, changes in the amount of land subdued in people, changes in the rise of vast new cities, changes in the growth of older cities almost out of recognition, changes in the graces and amenities of life, changes in the press without whose advancement no advancement can take place anywhere. Nor am I, believe me, so arrogant as to suppose that in five-and-twenty years there have been no changes in me, and that I had nothing to learn and no extreme impressions to correct when I was here first. And this brings me to a point on which I have, ever since I landed in the United States last November, observed a strict silence though sometimes tempted to break it, but in reference to which I will, with your good leave, take you into my confidence now. Even the press, being human, may be sometimes mistaken or misinformed, and I rather think that I have in one or two rare instances observed its information to be not strictly accurate with reference to myself. Indeed I have now and again been more surprised by printed news that I have read of myself than by any printed news that I have ever read in my present state of existence. Thus the vigour and perseverance with which I have for some months past been collecting materials for, and hammering away at, a new book on America, has much astonished me, seeing that all that time my declaration has been perfectly well known to my publishers on both sides of the Atlantic, that no consideration on earth would induce me to write one. But what I have intended, what I have resolved upon, and this is the confidence I seek to place in you, 
is, on my return to England, in my own person, in my own journal, to bear for the behoof of my countrymen such testimony to the gigantic changes in this country as I have hinted at to-night, also to record that wherever I have been, in the smallest places equally with the largest, I have been received with unsurpassable politeness, delicacy, sweet temper, hospitality, consideration, and with unsurpassable respect for the privacy daily enforced upon me by the nature of my avocation here and the state of my health. This testimony, so long as I live, and so long as my descendants have any legal right in my books, I shall cause to be republished as an appendix to every copy of these two books of mine in which I have referred to America. And this I will do, and cause to be done, not in mere love and thankfulness, but because I regard it as an act of plain justice and honour. I said these words with the greatest earnestness that I could lay upon them, and I repeat them in print here with equal earnestness. So long as this book shall last, I hope that they will form a part of it, and will be fairly read as inseparable from my experiences and impressions of America. Charles Dickens, May 1868 End of chapter 18 and postscript End of American Notes